You mean to say she's going to commit suicide? Oh, God, you wouldn't get me jumping off a roof, not for all the gin in London. How did she get up there in the first place? That's what I'd like to know. She's only a youngster by the look of things. She can't be more than 22. Hello? Hello, hello. Daily Tribune. <laughs> this is Ensign. Give me Frank Rogers. Hello. Frank, this is Tony. What the heck's happening? I thought you'd gone on your holiday. Frank, stop acting like an Hollywood editor and listen to what I'm saying. I don't think this kid's going to commit suicide after all. There's a sporting chance... What do you mean, not going to commit suicide? She's going to commit suicide. We've got the whole story written up. The moment she jumps, we go to press. Tony, don't you realise there's been nine suicides this week? Nine suicides! If this girl jumps... Just a minute. It looks to me as if she... What is it? Well, what's happening? This is awful. She's... What is it? What is it? What's happening? Tony, for heaven's sake! <laughs> Okay, Frank. You can print it. understand why these places are so out of the way. Have you ever been to one before? No. No, I'm afraid I haven't. Always got such a confounded air of mystery about them. Don't know why, I'm sure. Just look at this place. Know what Shakespeare said about death? Shakespeare? Well, not much in my line, I'm afraid. Ah, here we are. Uh, Mr. Gillespie? Aye? My name is Weatherby. Superintendent Weatherby of the Criminal Investigation Department, New Scotland. I know, I know, I've been expecting you. Uh, will you come in, please? Thank you. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Kelvin. Mr. Uh, Kelvin, uh, Charles Kelvin. Is this the first time you've been to a mortuary, Mr. Kelvin? Uh, yes, I... Uh, it's the first time. Well, uh, Hope you'll be able to identify the poor wee thing. It is the lassie you'll be wanting to see, the one that committed suicide. Yes. Well, uh, over here, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Kelvin, do you recognise her? Yes, I recognise her, Superintendent. She's my wife. By Timothy. By Timothy, if it isn't Scotland Yard. Hello, Temple. How are you? I'm fine. But I didn't expect to see you at... Uh... Come in. Come in, Sir Graham. Come in. This is a colleague of mine. Major Peters, Paul Temple. Oh, come in, Major. I'm awfully glad to meet you, Mr. Temple. I've heard quite a lot about you from Sir Graham. Sir Graham and I are old friends. We... Who is it, darling? That's my wife. She's dressing for dinner. She's been dressing since five o'clock. <laughs> I'll give you three guesses. Hello, Steve. Sir Graham. <laughs> Darling, whatever he says, the answer's no. You're telling me. <laughs> Come along, Sir Graham, Major Peters, let's go into the lounge. You're looking very fit, Temple, although perhaps a little tired about the eyes. Well, you're very good health, Sir Graham. Thank you, Temple. Skull. Skull. Mm. And how's the son and heir? Oh, he's fine. He's down at Bramley Lodge at the moment with Nanny. Steve and I are staying in town for three or four days. 
You're dining out tonight, I take it? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was just going to get dressed. <laughs> Excuse the dressing gown. It's my wife's idea of what the popular novelist should wear. <laughs> Strictly between ourselves, I've never been to China. <laughs> I don't think you've met Major Peters before. No, I don't think I have. Peters was attached to the intelligence people during the war. He's just been transferred to our special branch at Scotland Yard. Oh, I see. <laughs> Rather a square peg in a round hole, I'm afraid, sir. So you'll settle down. Would you like a cigar, Sir Graham, or...? No, no, I'm, um... Uh, I, I don't think so, thanks. Don't you think it might be rather a good idea if we came straight to the point, sir? That's always a good idea, Major. Just after 3.30 this afternoon, a girl committed suicide. Her name was Myra Kelvin. She threw herself off the roof of... Yes, it's in the papers. That suicide was the tenth. The tenth suicide to take place in London during the past week. Doesn't that strike you as being particularly significant? Significant? Yes. I don't think so, Sir Graham. Mr Temple, ten people have committed suicide. Yet you don't think that... Major Peters, I am by profession a novelist. I write, for my sins, detective novels. At the present moment, I'm engaged on a new opus significantly entitled Over My Dead Body. My contract stipulates 80,000 words. I have written precisely 2,354. If I have no interruptions, if I am left entirely alone, if I work industriously from nine in the morning until nine at night, there is a remote possibility that by the middle of next September I shall have completed... In other words, you're not interested. In other words, I'm not interested. Temple, listen. For the past three months, Major Peters, Superintendent Weatherby and myself have been investigating a case known to us at Scotland Yard as the Granger Affair. Three months ago, a girl called Leslie Granger committed suicide. There was an inquest, and it was discovered that Leslie Granger had been taking drugs, cocaine. She'd been getting the cocaine, presumably, from a secret source, from a man or woman known to her quite simply as Valentine. Valentine. Two days after Leslie Granger committed suicide, a girl called Marjorie Barton died under mysterious circumstances. Once again, there was an inquest and an autopsy. She'd been taking drugs? Yes. Cocaine? No. No, in this particular instance, heroin. Go on. Every single person that's committed suicide during the past three months has, without exception, been a drug addict. Are you suggesting... I'm that... suggesting that there exists in the West End of London at the present moment an organisation, a secret organisation, trafficking exclusively in dangerous drugs. That organisation is growing, Temple. It's growing so rapidly that unless we can put our fingers on the person who controls it, unless we can find... Unless the... we can find this mysterious Mr Valentine, there's going to be a new crime wave in this country. A crime wave quite without precedent. Believe me, that's no exaggeration. Sir Graham, tell me, are you convinced, quite convinced, that the people who committed suicide were in contact, in direct contact, with Valentine? Yes. Yes, we're quite convinced of that, Temple. And there's another point, Mr Temple. Uh, just in case you're interested. We found a compact on Marjorie Barton. A powder compact. Scribbled on the back of the compact was apparently a person's name. The name was Simon Lee. Simon Lee? Yes. Go on, Peters. Early this evening, Superintendent Weatherby interviewed a young man called Charles Kelvin. He's the husband of the girl that committed suicide this afternoon. As a matter of fact, he identified the body. Yes. During the course of cross-examination, Kelvin admitted that his wife had been, well, difficult, highly strung, emotional. On two occasions, during an hysterical outburst, he remembers quite distinctly that she repeated the name Simon Lee. Did the name have any particular significance, so far as Kelvin himself was concerned? No, I'm afraid not. He's just as puzzled as we are. He's never even heard of anyone called Simon Lee. Hmm... Well, you seem to have an interesting case on your hands, Sir Graham. I only wish I had the time to... Temple, this business can't be treated lightly. If this organisation develops... But it mustn't be allowed to develop, Sir Graham. I'm afraid our methods, orthodox methods, are not always the best in a case of this kind. You mean... I mean, to put it frankly, that, in my opinion, this is a case for Paul Temple. Well... What do you want me to do, exactly? Don't you know? 
We want you to catch Valentine, Mr. Temple. <laughs> Just like that. Well, after all, according to all accounts, you caught the knave, the front page man, Z4, the Marquis, and even Rex. What do you say, Temple? What can I say, Sir Graham? You mean... I mean... Let's all have another glass of sherry. Your change, sir. That's all right, waiter. Keep the change. Oh, thank you, sir. I hope everything was satisfactory. Everything's been fine, Luigi. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, shall I fetch the car? Where is it? It's in the mews just around the corner. No, it's all right, darling. I'll walk round with you. Okay. Paul. Yeah, Steve? You still haven't told me. Told you what, darling? You still haven't told me what Sir Graham wanted. Don't you know what he wanted? What do you mean? <laughs> darling, I'm quite convinced that you had your ear glued to the lounge door from the moment Sir Graham arrived, so there's not the slightest necessity Why, for me to tell you. Why, beast! What a, what a horrible suggestion. Well, didn't you? Most certainly not. I Didn't I, you? Well, uh, I may have overheard a little of the conversation, of course, but... <laughs> yes, I did listen, so there. So there. <laughs> Steve, don't look so serious. What are you going to do? Well, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to finish the novel I'm writing. But you heard what Sir Graham said. Well, of course I heard. If this organisation is allowed to develop... But it then... mustn't be allowed to develop. What's Sir Graham doing? And all the bright little boys at Scotland Yard, good gracious me, if they're going to send for Paul Temple or the least... Paul, I... you know as well as I do that if Sir Graham didn't consider this matter of paramount importance, he would never I say, have... look here, do you want me to get mixed up in this business? Oh, darling, uh, well, of course I don't. Well, what's all the fuss about? I'm not going to get mixed up in it. Don't be so silly, darling. I can sit back with my feet on the mantelpiece the same as the next fellow. Well, of course, if... If you feel like that, Paul. You bet yes. your bottom dollar I feel like that. Yes, sir. We're a pretty staid married couple these days, Steve, and don't you forget it. Why? Believe me, Steve, the thought of getting mixed up in anything so exciting, so dangerous as the Rex affair positively appalls me. Positively appalls me, old girl. Why, I... Oh, waiter, my bill. You've paid the bill. What? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> Darling... Do you know what I said to Sir Graham? Do you know what I said to Sir Graham when he had the audacity to suggest that this was a case for Paul Temple? No. What did you say? I said... Sir Graham, I said, I... I... I'd like to think it over. Yes. Yes, that's what I thought you said. <laughs> <laughs> Come along, my dear. Let's get our things. Had you an umbrella, sir? No, just an overcoat. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, hello, Superintendent. Beg your pardon? Uh, oh, good evening, Mr. Temple. Afraid I didn't recognise you, sir. Are you just arriving? Uh, no, no, no. As a matter of fact, I'm just leaving. Ah, good evening, Mrs Temple. Now, you remember Superintendent Weatherby? Yes, of course. Can we give you a lift, Weatherby? My car's just round the corner. Uh, no, I, I don't think so, thanks all the same, sir. But I, I'll stroll along to the corner with you. I hear that Sir Graham and Major Peters paid you a visit this evening. Yes. Yes, as a matter of fact, they did. I don't know whether they managed to interest you in this extraordinary... I'm afraid I told Sir Graham more or less what I'm telling you, Superintendent. Hmm. Well, generally speaking, I don't welcome outsiders. You know that, Mr. Temple. In fact, my opinion of amateur detectives is nobody's business. <laughs> but I must confess, after the way you handled the uh, Rex affair... Oh, I had a certain amount of luck over the Rex affair. We all need a certain amount of luck, sir. That goes without saying. Where's the car, darling? Hmm? Oh, it's just down here, Steve, in the mews. Stay with the Superintendent. I shan't be a minute. How long are you staying in town, Mrs. Temple? Oh, only for two or three days. I suppose by rights I really ought to be down at Bramley Lodge. But I promised my husband that we'd spend a few days... Well, 
Why? Mr. Temple, don't move. What I... are you doing? What are you doing hiding in my car? Who are you and... Mr. Temple, please listen to me. I... What I... is it? Are you hurt? Yes. It's my arm. I... Robert, listen. I want to tell you something about... About Simon Lee. Simon Lee? Why... Uh... Oh, dash, she's fainted. Weatherby! Weatherby! I quite see your point of view, Mrs. Temple. Hmm. On the other hand, if Scotland Yard feel justified in consulting you... Weatherby! What is it? Why? It looks to me as if... Uh... Do you hear me shouting? What is it? What's the matter, darling? There's a girl in my car. I think she's been hurt and she... She what? I think she was hiding there. Hiding? Huh? In your car? Yes. Is she badly hurt? I don't know. Well, come along. Let's have a look at her. Well, where is the car? It's almost at the end of the mews. Here we are. Well, where is she? Darling, there's no one here. But... But she was here a moment ago. Well, there's no one here now, Paul. It's just some kind of a joke, Mr. Temple, because... Of course it, it is. isn't a joke. She was here, lying on the back seat. Well, she's not here now. But the girl was in pain. She couldn't have moved without... Look here, this is a cul-de-sac. She didn't pass us coming down to the car. So she must be still here in the mews. But there's nowhere for her to hide. There isn't a doorway, a building or anything. It's just a brick wall. Unless she's standing in the shadow over there at the bottom of... Uh, wait here. Paul, you did see her, didn't you? Of course I saw her. She spoke to me. She said... She said what, darling? She said... I want to tell you about Simon Lee. Simon Lee? Yes. But that doesn't make Shh, any... Here's Weatherby. Well, there's no one there, Mr. Temple. Are you sure? Positive. There just isn't anywhere for the girl to hide. Why, a, a mouse couldn't hide itself in this mews. Well, she's not in the car. She didn't pass us. She's not at the bottom of the mews. There's nowhere for her to hide, so... So what? So I'm rather afraid that she must have just vanished into thin air, Superintendent. Come along, Steve. Jump in the car. We'll go back to the flat. Exasperating. I just can't understand you. Can't you, my sweet? You've been grinning like a Cheshire cat ever since we left the superintendent. Cheshire I... cat? I resent that. I most strongly resent it. The most extraordinary thing happens right under your very nose, something which completely bewilders you, and yet... What do you mean completely bewilders me? Who said it completely bewildered me? You speak for yourself, Mrs. Temple. But it must have bewildered you. The girl disappeared, literally disappeared from right, right under Right under you. my very nose. Yes, darling, you've said that before. <sighs> Gosh, I'm hungry. I could eat the hind legs off a turkey. I say, is there any of that cold chicken left in the... Uh, it's all right. I'll take it. Hello? 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 Uh, now it's your turn. Who... who is that, please? This is Mayfair 7864. I... I want to speak to Paul Temple. And this is Temple speaking. Mr. Temple, my name is Baxter. Sheila Baxter. I don't suppose you've heard of me, Mr. Temple, but please listen to what I'm saying. Please listen most carefully. It's very urgent. Well? Don't use the light. Don't use the light in the bedroom, Mr. Temple. What's that? What did you say? I said, don't use the light. Don't use the light in the bedroom, Mr. Temple. What do you mean, don't use the... I say, hello? Hello? Hello! Well, I'm damned. What is it? What's the matter? Well, I, I don't know what to make of that, I'm sure. What happened? Well, a woman's voice said, My name is Baxter, Sheila Baxter. I don't suppose you've heard of me, Mr. Temple, but please listen to what I'm saying. And then she said... And then she said what, darling? And then she said, Don't use the light. Don't use the light in the bedroom, Mr. Temple. Which bedroom? Well, I suppose she means our bedroom. What... What an extraordinary thing to say. Yes. Darling, that girl on the telephone, you don't think it was the girl who... No, it wasn't the girl in the mews, I'm sure of that. Oh. Stay here, Steve. I'm just going to take a look in the bedroom. No, I'll come with you, darling. Well, 
Everything seems to be all right. I don't know. We, we can't see very well. No, no, don't touch the switch. Uh, wait a minute. Stand over there near the bed. What are you going to do? Now, don't move now, Steve. Paul, what are you going to do? It's all right. Now, just keep still. I've got an India rubber in my pocket. I'm going to knock the switch on with the end of the rubber. Now, stand still. Oh! Oh, Paul! Paul, are you... It's all right, darling. You... It's all right. Take it easy. Take it easy. By Timothy. That's ingenious, if you like. What was it? A revolver was wired up to the electric current, and as soon as I touched the switch, the revolver... By Timothy, it's lucky for me that revolver was a bit cockeyed. Where... Where is the gun? Oh, it's over there, near the bed lamp. But, Paul, that must have been fitted up after we left the flat tonight. After... after Sir Graham left with Major Peters, yes. Darling, don't let's get mixed up in this business. Whatever happens, don't, don't let's Don't let's get, get mixed up in it. By Timothy, we seem to be in it up to the neck, as far as I can make out. You know, Steve, somebody must have known that Sir Graham was coming here. That trick with the revolver was a warning. A warning... A warning not to interfere. Yes. Paul, you don't think that that mysterious person, the person Sir Graham called Valentine, planted the girl in your car and then deliberately... And then deliberately? I don't know. Supposing... Th yes? Supposing you did decide to investigate this business, then... Then what? Well, what would be the first thing... First thing, thing I should do? The first thing I should do, darling, is to have a nice little chat with our old friend Snooker Riley. Snooker Riley? Yes. What Snooker doesn't know about the dope racket is nobody's business. Is that the man that was mixed up in the Norwich case? The funny little cop? Yes, he lives it... by himself on a houseboat over on the other side of Silverton. On a houseboat? Yes. Why? What are you thinking? Oh, I was just thinking. I've never been on a houseboat. There we are, sir. That's Snooker Riley's old top. Do you think you can pull alongside, Sergeant? Sure. Hold on, Mrs. Temple. I certainly will. I'm very much obliged to you, Sergeant, for taking all this trouble. Only too glad to be of service, sir. Shall I pick you up in five or ten minutes? I wish you would, Sergeant. It's a pleasure, sir. Snooker! Snooker! Where the devil is he? Jump to it, you son of a gun. You've got visitors. Visitors? What the devil do I want with visitors at this time of the... Oh, lummy. Oh, hello, Snooker. Oh, God bless my soul. If it isn't Paul Temple. How's the world been treating you, Snooker? Still in the dope bracket? Mr. Temple, please. Not in front of the sergeant. <laughs> hello. There's the piece of homework. Uh, the piece of homework, as you so delicately put it, Snooker, is my wife. Oh. Oh. Mr. Riley. I take it you're still a bachelor? Well, temporarily, Mr. Temple, as you might say. Temporarily. Here, give us your hand, Mrs. T. I'll give you a leg up to the cabin. Thank you. Uh, keep us steady, Sarge. Keep us steady. Yes, I've had this old tub for 12 years or more. Gets a bit monotonous at times, of course, but... It's a cheap way of living, and, well, I never was the one for gadding about, was I, Mr. T? No, Snooker, you were never one for gadding about. Snooker, tell me... Yes, Gov? Tell me, have you heard of a woman called Sheila Baxter? Sheila Baxter? No. Not that I know of, why? I wondered, that's all. I take it you've heard of Valentine. Val Valentine? Yes, yes, I, I've heard of Valentine, but... But what? I don't know anything about him. Nothing at all, see? I don't know whether Valentine's a man or a woman. Look here, what's the game? You're the second bloke what's asked me about Valentine tonight. The second bloke was... Oh? Who was the first? A chap called... Kelvin. Charles Kelvin. Kelvin? Yes. Do you know him? A foreign sort of bloke. Sounded to me a bit like a jerry. When did you see Mr Kelvin? About an hour ago. He came out here on his own, borrowed a boat from a chap over at Silverton. And he asked you about Valentine? Yes, yes he did. And I told him what I'm telling you. I know nothing about Valentine, nothing. All right, all right, Snooker, all right. Keep your nose out of this Valentine business, Mr Temple. 
Take my advice and keep your nose out of it. The snooker, tell me, did you offer Mr. Kelvin a drink? A drink? Why, no. I, uh, I noticed the two glasses on the side over there. Oh, <laughs> oh, that was O'Hara, a pal of mine. Dropped in about six o'clock tonight. Regular old sea dog. O'Hara? Oh, yeah, maybe you know him. No, no, I can't say I do. <laughs> He's a card. You'd like O'Hara. Captain Michael Sean Doherty O'Hara, skipper of the Simon Lee. The Simon Lee? <laughs> You have been listening to the first episode of A Case for Paul Temple, a serial in eight episodes by Francis Durbridge, with Crawford Logan as Paul Temple and Gerda Stevenson as Steve. Others taking part were Jimmy Chisholm, Richard Greenwood, Melody Grove, Lucy Patterson, Greg Powery, Gareth Thomas and Nick Underwood. The production for the BBC was by Patrick Rayner. We present Crawford Logan as Paul Temple and Gerda Stevenson as Steve in A Case for Paul Temple, a serial in eight episodes by Francis Durbridge. Episode two, in which Steve meets Captain O'Hara. Paul Temple, the celebrated novelist and private detective, is visited by an old friend, Sir Graham Forbes, the chief commissioner of Scotland Yard, and by a Major Peters, who is attached to the special branch of the Criminal Investigation Department. The following is a resume of episode one. For the past three months, Major Peters, Superintendent Weatherby and myself have been investigating a case known to us at Scotland Yard as the Granger Affair. Three months ago, a girl called Leslie Granger committed suicide. There was an inquest, and it was discovered that Leslie Granger had been taking drugs, cocaine. She'd been getting the cocaine, presumably, from a secret source, from a man or woman known to her quite simply as Valentine. Valentine? Two days after Leslie Granger committed suicide, a girl called Marjorie Barton died under mysterious circumstances. Every person that's committed suicide, Temple, every single person that's committed suicide during the past three months has, without exception, been a drug addict. Are you suggesting I'm that... suggesting that there exists in the West End of London at the present moment a secret organisation trafficking exclusively in dangerous drugs. That organisation is growing, Temple. It's growing so rapidly that unless we can put our finger on the person who controls it, unless we can find... Unless we can find this mysterious Mr Valentine, there's going to be a new crime wave in this country. A crime wave quite without precedent. Believe me, that's no exaggeration. Sir Graham, tell me. Are you convinced that the people who committed suicide were in contact with Valentine? Yes. And there's another point, Mr. Temple. We found a powder compact on Marjorie Barton. Scribbled on the back of the compact was apparently a person's name. The name was Simon Lee. Simon Lee? Yes. Go on, Peters. Early this evening, Superintendent Weatherby interviewed a young man called Charles Kelvin. He's the husband of the girl that committed suicide this afternoon. As a matter of fact, he identified the body. Yes. During the course of cross-examination, Kelvin admitted that his wife had been, well, difficult, highly strung, e emotional. On two occasions, during an hysterical outburst, he remembers quite distinctly that she repeated the name Simon Lee. Did the name have any particular significance, so far as Kelvin himself was concerned? No. He's just as puzzled as we are. He's never even heard of anyone called Simon Lee. Hmm. Well, um, what do you want me to do, exactly? Don't you know? We want you to catch Valentine, Mr. Temple. During the course of the same evening, Temple received a telephone message from a mysterious girl who introduced herself as Sheila Baxter. Later, Paul Temple, together with Steve, his wife, visits Snooker Riley. Snooker is an old acquaintance of Temple's, and he lives by himself on a houseboat. He is a strange, rather disreputable little cockney. I've had this old tub for 12 years or more. Gets a bit monotonous at times, of course, but 
It's a cheap way of living, and, well, I never was the one for gadding about, was I, Mr T? No, Snooker, you were never one for gadding about. Snooker, tell me... Yes, Gov? Tell me, have you heard of a woman called Sheila Baxter? Sheila Baxter? No. Not that I know of, why? I wondered, that's all. I take it you've heard of Valentine. Val Valentine? Yes, yes, I I've heard of Valentine, but... But what? I don't know anything about him. Nothing at all, see? I don't know whether Valentine's a man or a woman. Look here, what's the game? You're the second bloke what's asked me about Valentine tonight. The second bloke what's... Oh? Who was the first? A chap called Kelvin. Charles Kelvin. Kelvin? Yes. Do you know him? A foreign sort of bloke. Sounded to me a bit like a jerry. When did you see Mr Kelvin? About an hour ago. He came out here on his own. Borrowed a boat from a chap over at Silverton. And he asked you about Valentine? Yes. Yes, he did. And I told him what I'm telling you. I know nothing about Valentine. Nothing. All right, all right, Snooker. All right. Mr Timmel, I've been a lot of things in my time. And one way and another, I've rubbed shoulders with a pretty mixed crowd of customers. But... But what, Snooker? Oh, I've always had a liking for you, Governor. And so far as you're concerned, I've always... I've always tried to play the game. Yes. Yes, I believe you have. Well, keep your nose out of this Valentine business, Mr Temple. Take my advice and keep your nose out of it. The snooker, tell me, did you offer Mr Kelvin a drink? A drink? Why, no. I... Uh... I noticed the two glasses on the side over there. Oh! <laughs> oh! And that was O'Hara, a pal of mine. Dropped in about six o'clock tonight. Regular old sea dog. O'Hara? Oh, yeah, maybe you know him. No, no, I can't say I do. <laughs> He's a card. You'd like O'Hara. Captain Michael Sean Doherty O'Hara. Skipper of the Simon Lee. The Simon Lee? Why, yes. But, Paul, that was the name... Snooker, that... tell me. How long have you known O'Hara? O'Hara? Sure, I've known O'Hara donkeys for years. He's been skipper of the Simon Leap. Look here. If you're interested in O'Hara, China, then O'Hara's the bloke you want to talk to. That's not a bad idea at that, Snooker. How can I get hold of him? Do you know the Marquis of Bude? It's a pub just off the Causeway, Limehouse. It's not exactly my favourite rendezvous, but uh, I know it. I'll see you there tomorrow night. What time? Nine o'clock. Okay. Nine o'clock. With O'Hara. With O'Hara. I don't see your friend Snooker. No. Perhaps we're a bit on the early side. Quite a salubrious crowd by the look of things. Yes. Let's go and sit over there in the... Why, hello, Superintendent. Hello, Mr. Temple. I didn't expect to find you here, sir. Good evening, ma'am. What are you doing here, Weatherbeer? This place is a bit off the beaten track for you, isn't it? <laughs> well, if it comes to that, what are you doing here, Mr. Temple? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'd like you to meet Mr. Kelvin. Mr. Kelvin, Mr. and Mrs. Temple. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Kelvin. That's rather interesting. As a matter of fact, we're hoping to meet quite a friend of yours here tonight, Mr. Kelvin. Well... Indeed. Snooker Riley. Snooker? Oh. Oh, that was the man I saw last night on on the houseboat. Yes. He's not a friend of mine, Mr. Temple. I only... It's all right, Kelvin. You can talk. Yesterday afternoon, my wife committed suicide. Yes. I suppose you read all about it in the newspapers. They made quite a story, didn't they? Quite an interesting story of how she jumped off. She'd been taking drugs, cocaine. Go on. The drugs were supplied by a man called Valentine. I'm going to get Valentine, Mr. Temple. And when I do get him, when I do get my hands on the steady swine... old I... man, steady. Is that why you saw Snooker Riley? Because... I saw Snooker Riley because I'm convinced, quite convinced, that he's mixed up in this affair. That's the trouble with all you amateur detectives. You're picking a nice, unsuspecting little guy, and before you know where you are, you've sold yourself the idea that he's the master criminal. Excuse me. <laughs> Why, Snooker Riley Excuse wouldn't... me. 
What is it, Daisy? Is, uh, is this Mr Temple? Uh, no, no, this is Mr Temple. Oh. Well, there's a gent upstairs, says he's got an appointment to see you. Oh. Oh, thanks. Uh, room eight. You'll see the door at the top of the landing. OK. Would that be snooker? Could be. I think perhaps you'd better wait outside for me, darling, in the car. I shan't be very long. Yes, all right, Paul. I'll see you later, Weatherby. Yes, very good, Mr Temple. If I can get near the bar, Kelvin, I'll buy you a drink. Ah, <laughs> I've been expecting you. Come in, come in. Captain O'Hara. Captain O'Hara it is. Captain Michael Sean Doherty O'Hara, at your service, sir. Where's Snooker? Uh, Mr. Royley, I regret to say, was unavoidably detained. Cherchez la femme. Uh, sit down, sit down. What do you have? Do you usually engage a private sitting room, Captain O'Hara? Well, now it depends entirely on the company I'm expecting. Or would you prefer that we talk downstairs so that your friend Superintendent Weatherby can hear the conversation? We'll talk here, and I'll have a large whiskey. Ah, be dad, you're a man after my own heart. You'll be having it polluted. Thank you. Thank you. Now... What can I do for you? Snooker tells me you're skipper of the Simon Lee. I am that. And it's a fine boat, Mr. Temple, a fine boat. Now, if you're ever thinking of taking a cruise, I strongly... Advise... Captain O'Hara, have you ever heard of a man called Valentine? Valentine? Valentine, did you say? Why, oh, it's a common enough name. As a matter of fact, I once knew a girl in San Diego called Valentine. And a fine upstairs. I'm not talking figure. about a girl in San Diego. No? No. Well, supposing now you tell me exactly what it is you are talking about. I am talking about opium, cocaine, heroin. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm beginning to see daylights. Scotland Yard have proof, definite proof, that there exists in the West End of London an organisation a secret organization trafficking exclusively in dangerous drugs. The leader of that organization is a man or woman known as Valentine. I have reason to believe, O'Hara, that you have been in contact with Valentine. <laughs> if not in direct contact, then quite You've possibly... no reason to believe anything of this sort, man. And you know you haven't. You're guessing. You're quite right, Captain O'Hara. I'm guessing. <laughs> Mr. Temple, suppose now I talk quite freely, man to man, as you might say. Would it be off the record? Oh, quite off the record. I have your assurance on that point. You have my assurance. I wouldn't stand to lose anything by it, I mean. What you really mean is, would you stand to gain? The answer is yes, to the tune of a pony. A pony? A pony is 25 pounds, Captain O'Hara. Satisfactory? I'm thinking it's an infinitesimal sum to offer a man of my standing, Mr. Temple. But... Two months ago, just as I was on the point of leaving for Amsterdam, I received a telephone message from a man who called himself Sir Gilbert Dryden. He asked me to deliver a letter to a woman in Amsterdam. In return for the letter, I was to receive a parcel. I was told to bring the parcel back to England and to deliver it myself, personally, to an address in Bloomsbury. You delivered the parcel? Yes. What was in it? I don't know. It was just an ordinary, quite small, brown paper parcel. Was it addressed to Sir Gilbert Dryden? No. Who was it addressed to? Why, to be sure now, I just... Can't. Who was it addressed to? It was addressed to Mr. Valentine. When you delivered the parcel, did you see anyone at the house? A servant. I simply handed over the parcel to her, and she... She gave me an envelope. You expected an envelope? I did that. How much? Two... Two hundred quid. Mm, not bad. Not bad, O'Hara. 
Was this the first time that anything like this had happened? The first time, the first and the last, Mr. Temple, I swear it. You've not heard from Sir Gilbert since? No. What was the address in Bloomsbury? I don't... <laughs> the address was 479 Estonia Avenue. 479 Estonia Avenue? Yes. You say you don't know what was in the parcel? No. But be dad, I can guess. I think we can both guess, O'Hara. Tell me, where were you when you received the telephone message from Sir Gilbert? I was in a pub. The Golden Horse. It's near... Yes, the... I know it. Did you give him a definite answer there and then? I did that. I told him he could go to blazes. But you changed your mind, apparently. Yes, I changed my mind. Okay. Okay, O'Hara, okay. 479, you said. That's right. 479 Estonia Avenue. You can't mistake the house, Mr. Temple. You can't mistake it. This is the house, darling. Yes, it looks very much like it. 479. Yes, this is it, all right. Not particularly impressive, is it? There's a plate of some sort on the gate, Paul. It looks to me as Robert if it... Y. Frobisher, dental surgeon. Dental surgeon? Hmm. By Timothy, just look at the garden. Mm. They've got some pretty snappy weeds around here. Here's the bell. There doesn't seem to be anyone in. Well, they're certainly not hurrying themselves. It's a good job we're not howling our heads off with toothache. Well, try again. If at first you don't succeed, try... <laughs> There's no need to try again. What do you mean, darling? Look. Door's open. Good heavens. So it is. Paul, what are you going to do? Don't be silly, Steve. What do you think I'm going to do? Well, the last I time... I know, I know, I know just what you're thinking. Mrs. Trevelyan at Marshall House Terrace. But this is different, darling. O'Hara didn't send me here. He said... Simply... Hello. What's this? What is it? It's just a letter I noticed on the mat. It... Hello. That's interesting. Sir Gilbert Dryden, care of... Care of 479 Estonia Avenue, Bloomsbury. Well, that was the man O'Hara told you about. The man that telephoned him the night... Yes. I wonder if there's anything in this house, Steve. Well, there must be someone here, darling, otherwise... Would you like to wait in the car? While... No, no. I'll stay with you. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens anyway. Hello? Hello there. Anybody at home? Hmm. Hello there. Anybody at home? Darling, you needn't sound so aggressive. What's this place over here? I think that's a cloakroom. Here's the door to the surgery, Paul. <gasps> what is it? What's the matter? There's someone in there, sitting in the chair. Don't be silly, darling. There can't be. I tell you, I saw him. He's in the chair. He's in the dentist's chair, sitting in front of the window. But, Steve, you've heard me shouting. Darling, I saw him. I saw him. Honestly. All right. He... Wait a minute. There you are. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. My wife and I happen to... To... What is it? What's the matter with him? I think you'd better go outside, darling, before... Oh, Paul. Look. Look at his throat. He... Paul. Paul, he's been murdered. He's been... Wait here, by the door. He's dead? Yes. What's that you're holding, that card? It was on the chair. Well, what does it say? Paul, what does it say? It says... 
Permit me to introduce the real Captain O'Hara. Let this be a warning, Mr. Temple, and do not interfere. Valentine. you both. I'm glad you're back because you've got visitors. Visitors? Yes, ma'am. Sir Graham Forbes and another man called Major Peters. Oh, good. Thank you, Mary. Not at all. Hello, Temple. You're just the man I want to see, Sir Graham. You're just the man we want to see, Mr. Temple. Oh? Why? Temple, have you heard of a man called Sir Gilbert Dryden? Sir Gilbert? What is this, a joke? Hmm? Of course we've heard of Sir Gilbert Dryden. Why? Only tonight. What is it? Then... What's happened? All right, Peters, read the letter. This letter was delivered to Scotland Yard by a special messenger just after eight o'clock tonight. It was addressed to Sir Graham and was marked personal and urgent. Dear Sir, with reference to the Valentine case, I know the identity of Valentine and have conveyed this important information to a man called Snooker Riley. Riley will meet you tonight, shortly before midnight, at Delford Quarry, Kempton Heath. Respectfully yours, Sir Gilbert Dryden. Hmm. That sounds a phony to me. That's what I said. But Peter's... Yeah, I'm not so sure, Mr. Temple. In any case, we can't afford to ignore it. Where is Delford Quarry, Kempton Heath? It's about four or five miles the other side of Kempton. Weatherby should be there by now, sir. Yes. Weatherby? I've got Superintendent Weatherby and two of the flying squad units on the job. But we saw Weatherby about an hour ago. He was in a pub called the Marquis of Bude. Yes. He went there to meet a young man called Charles Kelvin. Kelvin's wife committed suicide yesterday afternoon, and I'm rather afraid the poor devil fancies himself as a sort of amateur detective. <laughs> He's certainly worrying the life out of poor old Weatherby. You say you've heard of this man, Sir Gilbert Dryden? Yes, as a matter of fact, I heard of him tonight for... The... But look here, are we supposed to be going to Kempton Heath because... Yes. Okay. I'll tell you all about it on the way there. Cheerio, darling, we shan't be very long. Take care. Yes, of course, don't worry. We'll be back in about an hour and a half, all being well. Delford Quarry. Not exactly my idea of a health resort. I wonder if that's Weatherby over there. Is that you, Weatherby? I think it is. Hello, Peters. Oh, good evening, sir. Well, have you seen anyone? No, no, sir, not a soul. Good evening, Superintendent. Oh, oh good evening, Mr. Temple. I didn't recognize you, sir. <laughs> this is a surprise. Yes, isn't it? Which way do you think Riley will come? Well, if he comes, it's my bet that he... What is it? I thought I heard something. No. No, I don't think so. You can imagine all sorts of noises. Once you'll hurry your magic. What is it, Temple? Didn't you hear that? What? Listen. I'm damned if I can hear anything. You will, Sir Graham. Listen. I may be deaf, but I'm not... Ye gods, I heard that all right. Quiet. Shh. It's near that tree over on the right. I'll swear it is. I've just gone from there. I never saw anyone. No. No, you wouldn't see him. What do you mean? Couldn't help but see him if I could. You don't mean he's... He's hanging from the tree. Oh, my God. Give me that torch, Weatherby. Quickly. Look. There he is. Do you recognize him, Temple? Yes. It's Snooker Riley. Oh, hello, Mary. I thought you'd be in bed by now. Well, I was just having a wee cup of coffee, Mr. Temple. I'm awfully partial to coffee. I'll make some more if you'd like some. Very much, yes. Where's Mrs. Temple? She's in the lounge. 
I'll be along with the coffee and two shakes of a lamb's tail. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Not at all, sir. You're welcome. Oh, hello, Paul. You look tired. Yes, I feel tired. Oh, my Timothy, what a night. Good Lord, is it quarter past one? Yes. You should have gone to bed, Steve. Mary's making some coffee. Yes, I know. By Timothy, I can use it. Did you see Snooker Riley? Yes, Steve. What happened? Well... You'd rather not talk about no, it? No, it isn't that. Only... What's going to happen, darling? About... about this business? I'm going to catch Valentine. Hmm. Oh, Steve, I know how you feel about my getting... I wonder who that is. I don't know. It's very late, darling. Oh, yes. All right, I'll take it. Hello? Hello. Mr. Temple? Yes? I don't know whether you remember, Mr. Temple, but I telephoned you last night. My name is... Oh, yes, I remember. Miss Baxter. Miss Sheila Baxter. Mr. Temple, don't... Don't believe a word he tells you. It isn't true, any of it. What do you mean? I say, who are you talking about? I'm, I'm talking about Dryden. Don't believe him, Mr. Temple. Please, please don't believe him. But how can I believe him? I haven't even... Hello? Hello? She's run off. Did you hear that? Yes. All of it? I, I think so. Yeah, I'm sure he'll see but me. what does it mean, Paul? I, I just don't... I'm... What is it, Mary? Well, I, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Temple, but this gentleman just insisted... I'm so sorry to intrude. May I come in? My name is Dryden. Sir Gilbert Dryden. You have been listening to the second episode of A Case for Paul Temple a serial in eight episodes by Francis Durbridge, with Crawford Logan as Paul Temple and Gerda Stevenson as Steve. Others taking part were Jimmy Chisholm, Richard Greenwood, Melody Grove, Eliza Langland, Robin Lang, Michael McKenzie, Greg Powery, Gareth Thomas and Nick Underwood. The production for the BBC was by Patrick Rayner. We present Crawford Logan as Paul Temple and Garda Stevenson as Steve in A Case for Paul Temple, a serial in eight episodes by Francis Durbridge. Episode three, in which Sir Gilbert explains. Paul Temple, the celebrated novelist and private detective, is visited by an old friend, Sir Graham Forbes, the chief commissioner of Scotland Yard, and by a Major Peters, who is attached to the special branch of the Criminal Investigation Department. Sir Graham tells Temple that for the past three months... For the past three months, Major Peters, Superintendent Weatherby and myself have been investigating a case known to us at Scotland Yard as the Granger Affair. Three months ago, a girl called Leslie Granger committed suicide. There was an inquest, and it was discovered that Leslie Granger had been taking drugs, cocaine... She'd been getting the cocaine, presumably, from a secret source, from a man or woman known to her quite simply as Valentine. Valentine? Sir Graham, are you suggesting... I'm suggesting that there exists in the West End of London at the present moment a secret organisation trafficking exclusively in dangerous drugs. Unless we can find... Unless we can find this mysterious Mr Valentine, there's going to be a new crime wave in this country. A crime wave quite without precedent. Believe me, that's no exaggeration. Early this evening, Superintendent Weatherby interviewed a young man called Charles Kelvin. He's the husband of the girl that committed suicide this afternoon. As a matter of fact, he identified the body. Yes, during the course of cross-examination, Kelvin admitted that his wife had been, well, difficult, highly strung, emotional. On two occasions, during an hysterical outburst, he remembers quite distinctly that she repeated the name Simon Lee. Did the name have any particular significance, so far as Kelvin himself was concerned? No, I'm afraid not. He's just as puzzled as we are. During the course of the same evening, Temple received a telephone message from a mysterious girl who introduced herself as Sheila Baxter. Later, Paul Temple, together with Steve, his wife, visits Snooker Riley. 
Snooker, a strange, rather disreputable little cockney, informs Temple that a friend of his, a certain Captain O'Hara, is the skipper of the Simon Lee. The following evening, Temple is informed by O'Hara that... Two months ago, just as I was on the point of leaving for Amsterdam, I received a telephone message from a man who called himself Sir Gilbert Dryden. He asked me to deliver a letter to a woman in Amsterdam. In return for the letter, I was to receive a parcel. I was told to bring the parcel back to England and to deliver it myself, personally, to an address in Bloomsbury, 479 Estonia Avenue. But when Temple and Steve arrive at 479 Estonia Avenue, they discover, to their astonishment, the dead body of the real Captain O'Hara. Later the same night, after a visit to Delford Quarry with Sir Graham Forbes and Major Peters, Temple returns to his flat. By Timothy, what a night. Good Lord, is it a quarter past one? Yes. You should have gone to bed, Steve. Mary's making some coffee. Yes, I know. By Timothy, I can use it. Did you see Snooker Riley? Yes, Steve. What happened? Well... You'd rather not talk about it? It isn't that, only... What's going to happen, darling, about... about this business? I'm going to catch Valentine. Hmm. Oh, Steve, I know how you feel about my... I wonder who that is. I don't know. It's very late, darling. Yes, it's all right. I'll take it. Hello? Hello. Mr. Temple? Yes? I don't know whether you remember, Mr. Temple, but I telephoned you last night. My name is... Oh, yes, I remember. Miss Baxter... Miss Sheila Baxter. Mr. Temple, don't... Uh, don't believe a word he tells you. It isn't true. It isn't true. Any of it. What do you mean? I say, who are you talking about? I, I, I'm talking about Dryden. Don't believe him, Mr. Temple. Please. Please don't believe him. But how can I believe him? I haven't even... Hello? Hello? She's run off. Did you hear that? Yes. All of it? I... I think so. But what does it mean, Paul? I, I just don't... I... What is it, Mary? I, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Temple, but this gentleman insisted I'm on... I'm so sorry to intrude. May I come in? My name is Dryden. Sir Gilbert Dryden. Oh. That's all right, Mary. You can close the door. Very good, Mr. Temple. You must forgive me for calling at this... This unearthly hour, Mr. Temple, but the matter is, I assure you, of some importance. Indeed. Since I don't suppose you've actually heard of me, Mr. Temple, I'd like to... On the contrary, Sir Gilbert. I appear to be coming across your name with monotonous regularity. Well, what do you mean, sir? I was thinking of your friend Captain O'Hara at 479 Estonia Avenue. Captain O'Hara? 479 Estonia Avenue? I take it you've never heard of Captain O'Hara? I most certainly have not, sir. Mr. Temple, why do you think I came to see you this evening? I don't know. Why did you come to see me, Sir Gilbert? Because I'm worried. Desperately. Terribly worried. I need your help, Mr. Temple. I need your help, and if you... If what? If you do what I want, sir. If you'll do precisely what I want, I'll... I'll pay you 1,500 pounds... Fifteen hundred pounds? Oh. Fifteen hundred pounds is a lot of money, Sir Gilbert. What uh, precisely would you like me to do for your fifteen hundred pounds? You have a reputation, sir. One might almost say an international reputation as a private investigator. I want you to undertake certain private or highly confidential investigations. What exactly would be the nature of these investigations? Mr. Temple, many years ago... A friend of mine died and left an only child, a little girl. I adopted that child. I, I sent her to college, to finishing school. I, well, I gave her literally everything that money could buy. When she reached the age of 21, she decided that she wanted to open a beauty parlor in Brussels. I agreed to finance the proposition, and in the spring of 1933, she opened a tiny but quite exclusive little shop in the Rue Respollier. I saw very little of her during the next two or three years, although we corresponded fairly frequently, and I continued to send her the usual monthly allowance. In 1938, um, rather to my surprise, 
she came to London and opened a beauty parlour in Mayfair. I was delighted by this move because I thought, not unnaturally, that we should see quite a great deal of each other. Mm. But she changed, Mr. Temple. The gentle, quiet, rather unsophisticated child had changed. In her place there was a strange, metallic kind of person. Well, don't misunderstand me. Outwardly she was just the same, charming, attractive, but inwardly something... something had happened. Go on. We went to the theatre together, we dined together, we appeared, as I say, outwardly, to be quite good friends. Then suddenly, about twelve months ago, I began to have my suspicions. I can't tell you how it happened or why it happened, but I began to suspect that she was mixed up in something. Something that was not quite, how can I put it, not quite above board. What do you suspect, Sir Gilbert? I suspect that she is the leader of an underground organization trafficking in dangerous drugs. I suspect that she is Valentine. Valentine? Her name? Well, professionally, she's known as Madame de Briac, but... Madame de Briac? But I know the shop. It's in Curzon Street. Yes, but her real name is Sheila Baxter. You offered me fifteen hundred pounds, Sir Gilbert. I what? want you to discover whether my suspicions are justified or not. If what I suspect is true, and she is Valentine, then I should want you to give me your assurance, Mr. Temple, that before you placed your information at the disposal of the police, she... She would have ample opportunity of leaving for, shall we say, South America. You decline my offer? Most decidedly. Then there's nothing more to be said. On the contrary, Sir Gilbert, on the contrary. Last night, during the course of certain investigations, I made the acquaintance of a man who called himself Captain O'Hara. Oh. Captain O'Hara informed me that he was the skipper of a cargo boat known as the Simon Lee. You've never heard of the Simon Lee, I take it? I've already told you, sir. I've never heard of Captain O'Hara, so it's highly unlikely that I should have heard of the Simon Lee. However, Captain O'Hara told me that two months ago he received a telephone message from you. From me? From you, sir. Asking him to deliver a letter to a woman in Amsterdam. In return for the letter, Captain O'Hara received a parcel which he delivered to an address in Bloomsbury. The address was 479 Estonia Avenue. But this is absurd. After our interesting chat with the so-called Captain O'Hara, my wife and I visited Estonia Avenue. Not only did we find the dead body of the real Captain O'Hara, but... What? But we found this letter. It was on the map just inside the hall. What, what letter? This letter. Addressed to Sir Gilbert Dryden. Oh. Mr. Temple, I assure you, I've never heard of Captain O'Hara. I know nothing, nothing whatsoever about her house in Estonia Avenue. What does it say? What does the letter say? It's addressed to you, Sir Gilbert. But open it, sir. Open it. Well? Read it for yourself. The package you are expecting will arrive on the 22nd. Meet me, as arranged, on the houseboat. I shall be there by 11. Valentine. The 22nd? That's tomorrow. No, today, darling, it's after midnight. Oh. But, but, what houseboat? What does he mean by package that you're expecting? I'm not expecting a package. I... Mr. Temple, what does it all mean? Sir Gilbert, tell me. Did you write to Scotland Yard about a man called Snooker Riley? What? Why, no. I've never heard of a man called Snooker Riley. I see. Would you like me to give you a piece of advice? Oh. Forget that you've ever seen or even heard of this letter and just... just wait. Wait? But, but supposing my suspicions about Sheila are true... If your suspicions about Madame de Briac are true, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yes, perhaps you're right. But you know, Mr. Temple, I, I'm not so sure that you haven't... But you haven't put rather a different complexion on things. In view of what you've told me tonight, in view of your most extraordinary story about the mysterious Captain O'Hara and the house in Estonia Avenue, I feel... Yes? I feel that I might perhaps have been a little hasty in, in jumping to conclusions about Sheila. In short, you're no longer convinced that she's Valentine. Well, I'm certainly beginning to think that there are other possibilities. You see, whoever Valentine is, he or she, of course... Is obviously intent upon throwing suspicion onto... Onto yourself? Yes. 
And Sheila wouldn't do that. She's changed, I know. Changed in a hundred and one ways, but I'm sure she wouldn't do that. Well, you have my assurance that this interview will be treated in the strictest confidence, Sir Gilbert. Thank you, sir. Well, good night, Mrs. Temple. I, um, I hope that we shall meet again under slightly pleasanter circumstances. I hope so too, Sir Gilbert. There's no need to show me up, Mr. Temple. I expect I shall be able to find my own way. Hmm. Well, what do you think of Sir Gilbert Dryden? I think... I think I'd like to have another look at him. What do you mean? Put the light out and come over to the window. There he goes, darling. Yes. It's an awfully nice car, isn't it? Yes. What are you looking at? I'm just looking at that car over on the other side of the road. It looks to me as... as if... Mm. Yes, I thought so. He's been waiting for him. Look, look. He's going to tail him. Who is it? Can you see? No. No, can you? It's a man, darling. But I... I can't see what he looks like. What's the number? I think it's GMT 678. Yes, GMT 678. Can you trace it? Yes, that ought to be simple. I'll have a word with Superintendent Weatherby in the morning. Draw the curtains, darling. <sighs> well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for bed. Hmm. Your hair doesn't look so good tonight, darling. What's the matter with it? Oh, I don't know. It just doesn't look so good. It could do with a perm, I suppose. Yes, I should get it done in the morning. Darling, you can't get it done in five minutes. You've got to make an appointment. Well, make an appointment. At Madame de Briac's. <laughs> 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 I can read you like a book. That's because I'm a plain type, my sweet. <laughs> appointment for a permanent wave. What name, madam? Temple. Mrs. Temple. It was a cancellation for half past eleven. Oh, yes, yes, I remember, madam, of course. Please excuse me. I shan't keep you a moment, madam. Mrs. Temple is here, madame de Briac. Yes, she just arrived. A very good madame. Madame de Briac will be down in a moment, Mrs. Temple, if you don't mind taking a seat. Thank you. Isn't the weather wretched for the time of year? Mm. Still, I suppose one mustn't grumble, must one? I suppose one mustn't. Oh, here's Madame de Briac. Good morning. Mrs. Temple? Yes. My name is Madame de Briac. I don't think we've had the pleasure no, of... No, your name was mentioned to me by Edith Carstairs, and I ah, thought... Ah, that... yes, Mrs. Carstairs. She's quite an old friend of ours. Would you mind stepping this way, Mrs. Temple? Thank you. Carol, tell Charles I'd like to see him in my office. Certainly, madame. Here we are, Mrs. Temple. Do sit down. What a lovely office. Oh, yes. I brought a lot of the stuff over from the continent with me when... No, uh, sit over here, Mrs. Temple, near the window. Oh, thank you. Huh. Mrs. Carstairs told me to ask for Andre, but... I'm afraid Andre's on leave just at the moment. But we've got a new man who is really most awfully good. Will you have a cigarette? Not just at the moment, thank you. I thought perhaps it might be quite a good idea if... if we had a little chat, Mrs Temple, I before... take it my telephone call this morning was not entirely unexpected. Well, quite frankly, no. I thought something like this might happen, especially after your visit last night from Sir Gilbert. You don't have to have a permanent wave, Mrs. Temple, if you don't want one. My husband would never forgive me if I didn't have one. But that's not why you came to see me. Not entirely. I've behaved rather stupidly over this business. I don't know why I didn't ring your husband up and talk to him quite frankly about the whole affair, but... Mrs. Temple, I don't know what Sir Gilbert told your husband last night, but please, please, whatever it was... Ask Mr. Temple to remember that there are always two sides to every story. 
That's why I'm here this morning, Madame de Briac, to hear your side of the story. When I was a child, my parents died as a result of a motor car accident, and I was adopted by Sir Gilbert Dryden. I um, expect he told you that. Yes. In those days, Sir Gilbert was sweet and kind and generous. I really can't speak too highly, Mrs. Temple, of, of the hundred and one things he did for me. When I left finishing school, I expressed a wish to open a beauty parlour in Brussels. I had a great many friends in that city, and I felt reasonably confident of making a success of the venture. But Sir Gilbert objected. At first, I couldn't quite see why he objected. And then suddenly, one morning, he told me that, that he wanted me to be his wife. I was amazed. Well, not only amazed, but completely bewildered. I'd always been fond of Sir Gilbert, of course, but I'd never, in my wildest dreams, contemplated the possibility of ever becoming his wife. Two weeks later, I left for Brussels. Go on. During my stay in Brussels, I received several letters from Sir Gilbert in which he repeated the offer he had made. I made a success of my business, and in 1938 I came to England. I was over here several weeks before I actually saw Sir Gilbert, and then he invited me to his house. Once again, he proposed, and I turned him down. But this time, this time, Mrs. Temple, there was a change, a change in his attitude towards me, I mean. He'd always been so kind, so gentle, but now he was arrogant, self-assertive, at times almost threatening. He told me quite frankly that no matter how many times I might turn him down, he intended ultimately to have his own way. About three nights ago, I visited his house again. When I arrived, Sir Gilbert was in the study. Rather to my surprise, he was talking to a strange, rather unkempt little man he called Snooker Riley. Snooker Riley? I overheard part of their conversation. I heard Sir Gilbert make arrangements about the revolver. The revolver that was to be placed in your bedroom and connected to the electric current. Mm. I was bewildered. I didn't know what to do. I was utterly and completely bewildered. Later, during the night... I made up my mind that the best thing I could do was to telephone your husband. Go on. Last night, I saw Sir Gilbert again. And he told me that if I didn't accept his proposal of marriage, he had every intention of contacting either the police or your husband and... Informing them that you were the leader of an organisation trafficking in drugs? Yes. Do you think Sir Gilbert is the leader of that organisation? What organisation? I don't know, Mrs. Temple. I don't know. I just don't know anything about that sort of thing. Why Sir Gilbert should suddenly take it into his head to mix with men like Snooker Riley, I don't know. I Really, I, I just don't know. Is Sir Gilbert a wealthy man? Well, yes, I've always thought so. He's not a millionaire, of course, but he's quite well off. Mrs. Temple, I know my story doesn't sound very plausible, but... I assure you, it's the truth. Thank you, Madame de Briac. I'll tell my husband everything that you... Please, please, not Madame de Briac. Sheila Baxter. Madame de Briac is merely a professional name. All right, Miss Baxter. I'll tell my husband your side of the story. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. And now, if you really would like that permanent wave, I'll... Ah, come in, Charles. You sent for me, madame? Yes. Charles, this is Mrs. Temple. I want you to... We meet again, Mr. Kelvin. It would seem like it, madame. You know each other? Yes. I met Mr. I Kelvin. I frequently had the pleasure of attending to Mrs. Temple, madame, when I was at Armand's. Oh. Oh, I see. This way, madame. Yes, Peters, what is it? Mr. Temple is here, Sir Graham. Oh, good. Ask him in, Peters. Mr. Temple. Thank you. Hello, Sir Graham. Ah, oh, come in, Temple. I've been expecting you. You look very spruce, Major. Where are you off to? Is it your night out? Well, officially, Mr. Temple. It's supposed to be my day off, but... No rest for the wicked, Peters. 
nor those who tried to catch them either, by the look of things, sir. <laughs> There's a very good detective film at the Empire, Major. Hmm. Well, if it's all the same to you, sir, I'll take Hedy Lamar. <laughs> good night, sir. Good night, Peters. Good night, Mr. Temple. Good night, Major. Well, are you ready, Temple? Yes, I'm ready. You haven't told anyone about this little expedition, have you, Sir Graham? Not a soul. Sergeant Donovan's taking us. We'll give him his instructions once we get started. Good. What exactly did the letter say, Tim? Well, it was addressed, or rather was apparently addressed, to Sir Gilbert, and it said, Meet me as arranged at the houseboat. I shall be there by eleven. Valentine. Mm. Of course, we don't know for certain that it's Snooker Riley's houseboat. And we, oh, we don't... don't know anything for certain, Sir Graham. We've just got to take a chance on it. Yes, yes, I agree. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, sir. I've uh, brought you the Kelvin report. You'll put it on the desk, Weatherby. Evening, Mr. Temple. Good evening, Superintendent. As a matter of fact, you're just the man I want to see. Yes, sir. I want you to do a little job for me, if you will. I want you to trace a car, find out who it belongs to. It's a small black car, two-seater, I'm not sure of the make. Registration number GMT678. Certainly, Mr. Temple, I'll... Uh, GMT678? That's right. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Well, that won't take very long. What do you mean? <laughs> it's my car. Your car? Yes. Were you out in it last night, Superintendent? No. No, as a matter of fact, I lent it to Major Peters. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's damn funny. My car. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the joke's on me, Superintendent. <laughs> At least, I think it is. Are you ready, Temple? Hmm? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I'm ready, Sir Graham. Good night, Weatherby. Good night, sir. You've been out here once before this week, haven't you, Temple? Yes. Steve and I came out two or three nights ago. It was the night that girl disappeared, Sir Graham. You remember? Oh, yes, yes. Weatherby told me all about it. There's the houseboat, sir. Over to the starboard. Where? Oh, yes. Pull alongside her, Sergeant, and make as little noise as possible. Very good, sir. Of course, Snooker isn't in there, you know, sir. They found poor yes, old Snooker. Yes, we know, Take it sir. quietly. Take it quietly, Sergeant. Very good, sir. Doesn't appear to be anyone on board, Temple. No. What time do you make it? Uh, it's about ten to eleven. Well, we're all right. We're just in nice time. What would you like me to do, sir? Would you like me to wait or cruise around for five or ten minutes? Cruise around, Sergeant, but don't keep too near the houseboat. Yeah, very good, sir. Steady, Temple. Yeah, OK. Just give me a hand, Sir Graham. Watch your step. Not exactly the Ritz, is it? All in. Just look at the place. I must have left the cabin like this the night he... What is it? I thought I heard something. No, no, I don't think so, Temple. It looks as if Snooker existed exclusively on a diet of sardines. Yes. It doesn't seem to have been very clever at opening tins, either. What the deuce is that supposed to be? Don't tell me that's where the poor devil slept. Yes. Well, I believe in the summer he used to... Do you hear it? No. Yes. I... Now do you hear it? Yes. Stand over there, Sir Graham, near the door. Now watch him, Temple. Listen. Whoever he is, he's on his own. It sounds like it. Here he comes. Don't move! Stand where you are! Why? Sir Graham! Mr. Temple! Good evening, Major Peters. When I was a child, my parents died as a result of a motor car accident, and I was adopted by Sir Gilbert Dryden. I um, expect he told you that. Yes. In those days, Sir Gilbert was sweet and kind and generous. I really can't speak too highly, Mrs. Temple, of, 
of the hundred and one things he did for me. When I left finishing school, I expressed a wish to open a beauty parlor in Brussels. I had a great many friends in that city, and I felt reasonably confident of making a success of the venture. But Sir Gilbert objected. At first, I couldn't quite see why he objected. And then suddenly, one morning, he told me that, that he wanted me to be his wife. I was amazed. Well, not only amazed, but completely bewildered. I'd always been fond of Sir Gilbert, of course, but I'd never, in my wildest dreams, contemplated the possibility of ever becoming his wife. Two weeks later, I left for Brussels. Go on. During my stay in Brussels, I received several letters from Sir Gilbert in which he repeated the offer he had made. I made a success of my business, and in 1938, I came to England. I was over here several weeks before I actually saw Sir Gilbert, and then he invited me to his house. Once again, he proposed, and I turned him down. But this time, this time, Mrs. Temple, there was a change, a change in his attitude towards me, I mean. He'd always been so kind, so gentle, but now he was arrogant, self-assertive, at times almost threatening. He told me, quite frankly, that no matter how many times I might turn him down, he intended ultimately to have his own way. About three nights ago, I visited his house again. When I arrived, Sir Gilbert was in the study. Rather to my surprise, he was talking to a strange, rather unkempt little man he called Snooker Riley. Snooker Riley? I overheard part of their conversation. I heard Sir Gilbert make arrangements about the revolver. The revolver that was to be placed in your bedroom and connected to the electric current. I didn't know what to do. Later, during the night, I made up my mind that the best thing I could do was to telephone your husband. Go on. Last night, I saw Sir Gilbert again, and he told me that if I didn't accept his proposal of marriage, he had every intention of contacting either the police or your husband and... Informing them that you were the leader of an organization trafficking in drugs? Yes. Do you think Sir Gilbert is the leader of that organization? What organization? I don't know, Mrs. Temple. I don't know. I just don't know anything about that sort of thing. Later the same day, Temple and Sir Graham Forbes pay an unexpected visit to the home of the late Mr. Snooker Riley. This is a houseboat, a somewhat dilapidated houseboat, situated on the river about two miles from Silverdale. Hmm. Not exactly the Ritz, is it? All in. Just look at the place. I must have left the cabin like this the night he... What is it? I thought I heard something. No, no, I don't think so, Temple. He looks as if Snooker existed exclusively on a diet of sardines. Yes. He doesn't seem to have been very clever at opening tins, either. What the deuce is that supposed to be? Don't tell me that's where the poor devil slept. Yes. Although I believe in the summer he used to... Do you hear it? No. Yes. Now do you hear it? Yes. Stand over there, Sir Graham, near the door. Now watch him, Temple. Listen. Whoever he is, he's on his own. It sounds like it. Here he comes. Shh. Don't move! Stand where you are! Why? Sir Graham? Mr. Temple? Good evening, Major Peters. Peters? What the devil are you doing here? Oh, well, if it comes to that, Sir Graham, what the devil are you doing here? Read this letter, Major Peters. Hmm? What is it? It was addressed to Sir Gilbert Dryden. The package you're expecting will arrive on the 22nd. Meet me as arranged on the houseboat. I shall be there by 11, Valentine. Valentine? Good, good heavens. You mean to say that you were here, waiting for Valentine, and I, I turned up? Yes. But, but why didn't you tell me that you were coming here? Why didn't you tell me about this letter? Well, I purposely asked Sir Graham to keep it confidential. I see. Well... 
I'm afraid you've let yourself in for a rather a damp squib, haven't you, Mr. Temple? What do you mean? Well, you expected Valentine. We got Major Peters. You still haven't told us what you're doing here, Peters. Mr. Temple isn't the only one who likes to keep things to himself. You remember that knife we found by Snooker Riley? Yes. It has a print on it. Quite a good one. Whose? I don't know, Mr. Temple. Not yet. But I want to find out whether the man who handled that knife ever visited Snooker here on the houseboat. If he did, well, that's something to go on. You will observe, Mr. Temple, that I have a fingerprint outfit with me. I hope you'll agree that that substantiates my story. Your story doesn't need substantiating. If you say that you came here... What's that? I think it's the sergeant. Wait a minute. Sergeant Donovan, sir. We'll be with you in a moment, sergeant. Very good, sir. Have you seen anyone? Only Major Peters, sir. Well, we'll leave you to it, Peters. Good night. Good night, Sir Graham. Good night, Mr. Temple. Good night, Major. to me as if it's getting foggy, Temple. It doesn't look too clear. What's that place, Sergeant? Over on the right. Well, uh, oh, that's uh, it's a warehouse, sir. Ah. You must have been up and down the river a few times, Sergeant. I wish I had as many pounds, sir. Mm. Uh -huh. Cigarette? Thank you, Sir Graham. Sergeant? Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Hello, I wonder if this is Peter's. Yes. Sounds like his boat. I don't know. I should have said... What's happening? It sounds to me... Keep is... well over to the left, Sergeant. I don't think that's Peter's. No, no, it's certainly not Major Peter's shouting. Oh, turn your lights full on, Sergeant. Quickly. That's better. Maybe he's over on... Keep her steady, Sergeant. Keep her steady. It's not Peter's in the boat, Temple. Well, I'm damned if I can see who it is. Oh, they hit the left. There's a reserve, sir. Over on the port. Look out! Oh. Keep down! Keep down, Sir Graham! Watch yourself, Temple! Are you all right, Sergeant? Yes. Well, I wish to God the swine would put out that blasted light. Look out! Oh! It's going. Yes. Are you okay, sir? I wonder where the other man is. I heard him hit the water. Yes. You know, it sounded to me, Temple, as if the poor devil was being abducted. And when he heard our launch... He decided to make a dash for it. Uh, there he is, sir. Look. Where? Where? By Timothy, you're right. Pull her over, Sergeant. Watch yourself, Temple. Now give me your hand, Sir Graham. For God's sake, don't fall overboard. Or we'd never I'm get... all right. Give me your hand. Now, take it steady, Sergeant. Take it steady. Okay, I've got him. Try it. Get hold of his arms, Temple, if you can. Pull. Pull, Sir Graham. Here he comes. Ah. He's not an Englishman. Looks to me like a Chinese. Oh, whatever he is, sir. He looks a goner. Yes, yes, I'm afraid you're right, Sergeant. The shot killed him. Yes. Do you recognize him, Temple? He... No, I've never seen him before. I wonder who he is. Shall I search him, sir? Uh, wait a minute, Sergeant. He's got something in his hand. It looks to me like a watch chain. Yes. Yes, it is. He must have pulled it off the man he was struggling with, sir. The man on the boat. Yes. Temple? Temple, I've seen that watch chain somewhere before. You certainly have, Sir Graham. And I know where. Where? On Mr. Charles Kelvin. <laughs> I'm glad you've taken me into your confidence, Temple. But it seems to me that we've got to believe one or the other. We can't believe both. Mm. Either Miss Baxter is lying about Sir Gilbert, or Sir Gilbert is lying about Miss Baxter. Now, in view of what you've told me, yes. I put my money on the girl. I think she's telling the truth. Yeah, so does Steve. But I'm not so sure. Well, 
Miss Baxter, or Madame de Briac, if you like, has got a pretty flourishing business temple. She's a good-looking girl, too. Just the sort of girl Sir Gilbert would fall for. Does he fall easily? According to all accounts. Easily and frequently. Hmm, I see. Of course, even if she is telling the truth, it doesn't necessarily mean that Sir Gilbert is Valentine. Just no, as... Yeah, if he's telling the truth, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's Valentine either. Exactly. Have you seen this girl, Sheila Baxter, yourself? No. I'm seeing her tonight. Steve's invited her to the flat. Good. I think that's... <clears throat> what is it, Weatherby? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir, but uh, Calvin's here. Oh, all right, Weatherby. Ask him in. Oh, did you mention the watch chain? Not a word, sir. Oh, Good. Superintendent? Uh, yes, Mr Temple? Is Major Peters in? Yes, I believe he's in his office, sir. Well, would you be kind enough to give him this cigarette case? Uh. Handle it carefully. Tell him I believe there's a fingerprint on it, and I'd like him to check it with the one he found on the knife. The knife that killed Snooker Riley. Very good, sir. Oh, um, whose print is it, Mr. Temple? We'll discuss that later, Superintendent. Very good, sir. You sent for Kelvin? Yes. I thought we might as well hear what he's got to say. By the way, I had the report through this morning from the League of Nations people. They check up for us, you know, on the distribution of narcotics. The figures have risen during the past two or three months, I'm afraid. Hmm. You know, Temple, the thing that beats me is where exactly Valentine makes his contact. He must have a sort of distribution centre, almost a kind of headquarters. Did you check on the Simon Lee? Yes, we checked on the Simon Lee, all right. But it seems a pretty reliable sort of vessel. Belongs to a first-class company. Of course, O'Hara, the, the real Captain O'Hara, was mixed up in this business, but so far as we can make out, the rest of the crew seem to be pretty straight. Mm. I'd like to get my hands on the man who impersonated O'Hara. <laughs> if we once got that bird in the cage and made him talk, we'd be getting somewhere. I'd make him talk, all right. <clears throat> Mr. Kelvin, sir. Thank you, Weatherby. Come in, Kelvin. Sit down. Good morning, Mr. Temple. Good morning. Sit down, Kelvin, sit down. Superintendent Wesby told me that you wanted to see me, Sir Graham. Yes. I want you to have a look at this. What is it? It's a watch chain, of course, but... Don't you recognize it? Why... why no? Isn't it yours? I've... I've never seen it in my life before. Haven't you, Mr. Kelvin? Haven't you? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, it is mine. Only... Only what? Where did you find it? Where would you expect us to find it, Mr. Kelvin? I don't know, sir. I... I lost the chain two or three days ago. I... I think I lost it the day my wife died. I see. Mr. Kelvin, tell me, is Charlie King a friend of yours? Charlie King? Yes. I've never heard of the gentleman. What... What makes you think that he might be a friend of mine? We picked him out of the river last night. He had your watch chain. Charlie King? No? No, I've never heard of anyone called Charlie King. Mr. Kelvin, my wife tells me that you work for Madame de Briac. Yes, yes, Mr. Temple. How long have you been there? Just, just over a fortnight. When my wife said that you'd met before, I believe you deliberately... I told Madame de Briac that I'd attended to Mrs. Temple at my last place, but that was not true. Then why did you say it? Because I didn't want Madame de Briac to know that I'd met Mrs. Temple with Superintendent Wesby. Oh? Why not? Well, it's difficult to explain, but... You see, when my wife committed suicide, I received an awful lot of publicity. Madame de Briac was nice about things, of course, but... Well... You know, publicity of that kind is not good for business. Not for a business like Madame de Briac's. I see. Excuse me, sir, but Bradley's just sent his report through on Charlie King. I thought you might like to see it. It's interesting, sir. Yes, yes, all right. Mr. Kelvin, would you mind stepping into the other office for a moment? Um, show Mr. Kelvin into Inspector White's office, Weatherby. Very good, sir. Follow me, please. That boy is not telling the truth. No. Shall we pick him up? No. No, I don't think so, Sir Graham. Not just at the moment. Do you think... What? Do you think he's Valentine? Do you, Sir Graham? I don't know. 
I don't know, Temple. It's an interesting report on Charlie King, sir. Well, let's have it, Weatherby. <clears throat> he was 47, lived in Charter Street. Was single, but apparently lived with an Italian girl. He did a stretch at Sing Sing in... Uh, 1926 for peddling dope. That's interesting. Mm. And another stretch in 31. In 1938, he bought the San Chow restaurant in Eden Street. San Chow restaurant? Mm. That's quite an expensive sort of... Mr. Temple. What is it, Peters? Yes, Major. Mr. Temple, that cigarette case, the one you sent down with Superintendent Weatherby, I've compared the fingerprint with the one on the knife, the knife that killed Snooker Riley. Well? They're identical. You're positive? Absolutely positive. Whose is it? Whose fingerprint is it, Temple? Now, that's interesting. That's interesting. Won't you really have another drink, Miss Baxter? No, no, really, I must be going. I have an appointment. Nonsense. Of course you mustn't be going. Here we are, Steve. Give this to Miss Baxter. <laughs> no, really, Mr. Temple. I... I... <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Skull. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> darling. You always mix them too strong. It's dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm awfully grateful to you for coming along here tonight and, well... Oh, repeating my story... I'm afraid it doesn't sound a very plausible one, Mr. Temple, whichever way one looks at it. Miss Baxter, I meant to ask you, how long have you known Mr. Kelvin? Mr. Kelvin? Oh, Charles. About two months. He used to work for Armand before... Mr. Temple, you don't think that Charles Kelvin's mixed up in this business, do you? Well, his wife committed suicide, you know that, don't you? Yes. Yes, I know that, but... She was a strange, emotional sort of girl. Did you ever meet her? No. She came to the shop once or twice to see Charles. I rather liked her, but she always seemed so highly strung, so sensitive. I do hope Charles isn't mixed up in this affair, Mr Temple, because publicity, the wrong sort of publicity, isn't good for my type of business, you know. No, I suppose it isn't. Well... Now, I must be going. Oh, have another drink. No, no. It's a pity you can't stay and have dinner with us. As a matter of fact, we're going out, darling. But why don't you join us? That's awfully sweet of you both, but I've got a date. Well, some other time. We'll make a night of it. I'd like to. Where are we going, Paul? I've booked a table at the San Chow, darling, for eight o'clock. The San Chow? Yes, it's in Eden Street. Oh. Remember, Steve, we went there once before. It's a Chinese restaurant, isn't it? Yes. Oh, I remember. I'll see you out. Good night, Mr. Temple. Good night, Miss Baxter. Well? Well what, darling? What do you think of Madame de Briac? Well, she's more or less what you described. Did you believe her story? It was interesting. Uh, do you want another drink? No. No, I suppose I'd better get changed. You remember that knife, Steve? The one that killed Snooker Riley? Yes. Major Peters found a fingerprint on it. It was Sir Gilbert Dryden's. Sir Gilbert Dryden's? Yes. Well, doesn't that more or less confirm what Miss Baxter told us? She said she overheard Sir Gilbert talking to Snooker Riley about the revolver. The revolver in our bedroom? The re What's that? It's Miss Baxter. Wait here, Steve. <sighs> Miss Baxter, what is it? Are you all right? Uh, yes. Yes, I I'm all right, but... Oh, my throat, it's... Now, take it easy, Miss Baxter. Take it easy. You're all right. I, I was getting out of the lift when someone came up behind me. He must have come up the stairs from the basement because... Oh, it was horrible. Horrible, horrible. Now, just take it easy, Miss Baxter. There's nothing to worry about. I, I, I felt his hands on my neck. I, I felt his hands getting tighter and tighter. I, I felt his hands... I felt, oh, oh, it was horrible. Are you all right, Miss Baxter? Yes, she's all right, darling. Did you recognise him? No. No, I was frightened. I, di I didn't even look at his face. I caught 
caught hold of his jacket. I, I screamed, I scratched, I kicked, I, I... I don't know what I didn't do. Well, you succeeded in tearing a button off his jacket. Well, Look, it's on the floor. Well, that ought to be useful. Where's your car, Miss Baxter? Just round the corner. Do you feel well enough to drive? Yes, yes, I, I feel much better now, thanks. Oh, I wonder who it was, Mr. Temple. Just don't think about it. Come along. Come along to the car. Would you like some more coffee? No, I don't think so, thanks, darling. You know, I don't remember coming to this restaurant after all, Paul. Don't you? It's not so long ago. Ricky told us about it. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> I wonder how he's getting on. Ricky? He's getting on all right. You leave that to Ricky. Why you wanted to introduce him to that film director, heaven only knows. We lost the best servant we ever had. It's one thing about this place. You can be nice and confidential. Mm -hmm. I rather like all this partition nonsense. I suspect we're the only married couple in the place. That's just what I was thinking. <laughs> you say this place belongs to Charlie King, the man you picked out of the river, La. What is it, Paul? Look who's here. Sir Gilbert Dryden. Now I wonder why on earth he... Hello, Mr. Temple. Say, so we meet again, sir. Good evening, Mrs. Temple. Good evening. I didn't expect to see you here, Sir Gilbert. Yeah. Well, I quite frequently dine here, Mr. Temple. I suppose you might always call me an habitué. Uh, Mr. Temple, forgive me asking, but yes? um, did you visit the houseboat last night? Remember you? Yes, we visited the houseboat, Sir Gilbert. What happened? Oh, nothing of importance. Valentine didn't uh, turn up then? Not unless Valentine happens to be Sir Graham Forbes <laughs> or Major Peters. Major Peters? Uh, Major Peters is attached to the special branch. Oh, oh, I see. Ah, I see my guest has arrived. Please excuse me. Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Goodbye, Sir Gilbert. Goodbye, Temple. Good night, Sir Gilbert. Darling, darling, did you see his coat? The button, the bottom button of his jacket. It was... It was missing. Hmm? Yes, Steve, I noticed it. Paul, Paul, that proves conclusively... It doesn't prove anything, darling. It only... By Timothy. What is it? That man. The man Sir Gilbert's talking to. Well? That's the gentleman I've been looking for. Who is it? It's the man that impersonated O'Hara. Are you sure? Yes. Yes. Now listen. Listen, Steve. I want you to go outside and get the car. Meet me at the front entrance and keep the engine running. But... Now, darling, please do as I tell you. Yes. Yes, all right. Waiter. Sir? Who's that gentleman talking to Sir Gilbert Dryden? Where, sir? Oh, oh, that's an American gentleman, sir. I'm Mr. Leyland. Well, would you be good enough to tell Mr. Leyland I'd like to see him in the, in the entrance hall? Certainly, sir. Your name? Uh, tell him Mr. Kelvin would like to see him. Mr. Charles Kelvin. Yes, sir. Here we are. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kelvin, you said, sir. That's right, Mr. Kelvin. Oh, and waiter. If you can possibly help it, don't let Sir Gilbert hear what you're saying. Very good, sir. Are you looking for someone, Mr. Leyland? Yeah, the waiter said that, uh, that... Uh... Remember me? It's a small world, isn't it? Captain O'Hara. <laughs> what do you mean? Is this some kind of a joke? Because if it is, I... Uh... What? What's that you've got in your pocket? What does it look like, Mr. Leyland? Well, it... It looks like a revolver. And that's precisely what it is. What do you want me to do? I want you to turn round, walk straight out of here, and get in my car. I'm just supposing... Yes? Just supposing I don't walk straight out of here, Mr. Temple. Then you'll be carried out, Mr. Leyland. On a stretcher. That's the gentleman I've been looking for. Who is it? It's the man that impersonated O'Hara. Are you sure? Yes. Yes. Now, listen. Listen, Steve. I want you to go outside and get the car. Meet me at the front entrance and keep the engine running. But... Now, darling, please do as I tell you. Yes. Yes, all right. 
Waiter. Sir? Who's that gentleman talking to Sir Gilbert Dryden? Where, sir? Oh, oh, that's an American gentleman, sir. I'm Mr. Leyland. Well, would you be good enough to tell Mr. Leyland I'd like to see him in the, in the entrance hall? Certainly, sir. Your name? Uh, tell him Mr. Kelvin would like to see him. Mr. Charles Kelvin. Yes, sir. Here we are. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kelvin, you said, sir. That's right, Mr. Kelvin. Oh, and waiter, if you can possibly help it, don't let Sir Gilbert hear what you're saying. Very good, sir. Are you looking for someone, Mr. Leyland? Yeah, the waiter said that, uh, that... Uh... Remember me? It's a small world, isn't it? Captain O'Hara. <laughs> what do you mean? Is this some kind of a joke? Because if it is, I... Uh... What? What's that you've got in your pocket? What does it look like, Mr. Leyland? Well, it... it looks like a revolver. And that's precisely what it is. What do you want me to do? I want you to turn round, walk straight out of here, and get in my car. I'm just supposing... Yes? Just supposing I don't walk straight out of here, Mr. Temple. Then you'll be carried out, Mr. Leyland. On a stretcher. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, ma'am, but... Oh, gracious me, Mr. Temple, is that a revolver? That's all right, Mary. Just just go back to the kitchen for a moment. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Temple. Go through to the lounge, Mr. Leyland. On your left. Hmm? Nice place you got here. We like it. Very nice. And they say crime doesn't pay. Ah, but I only write about it, Mr. Leyland. Yeah. You know, I got a hunch that isn't a revolver in your pocket after all, Mr. Temple. Have you? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Oh. Would you like me to prove to you that it's loaded? No. No, I'll take your word for it. Good. Sit down, Mr. Leyland. Take the armchair. Yeah, I'm okay. Do you mind if I ask you why exactly you brought me back here? I brought you back here, Mr. Leyland, because I wanted to have a little chat with you. Ha <laughs> ha. A little chat. Is that so? Well, before the tete-a-tete, -tete, do you mind if I have a drink? Go ahead. Mix yourself one. Thanks. <laughs> a little chat. Mr. Temple, you have a sense of humor. I also have a .25 automatic pistol, Mr. Leyland, so if I were you, I shouldn't come too near. <laughs> that? Okay. Okay. Skull. Skull. <sighs> Mr. Temple, tell me. Just to what extent do you think I'm mixed up in this business? Supposing you tell me, Mr. Leyland. Well, now, supposing I do. Will you believe me? We shall see, Mr. Leyland. We shall see. Okay. I'll tell you how I fit into this business, Mr. Temple. I'll tell you, so far as I'm concerned, exactly how the whole business started. Two days ago, about half past eleven in the morning, I was sitting in my flat with a first-class hangover and a jug of black coffee when... Suddenly, to my surprise, I heard the doorbell ringing. I don't like visitors at that time of the day, so... Take it easy. Take it easy, brother. Mr. Leyland? Yeah? My name is Kelvin. Charles Kelvin. May I come in, Mr. Leyland? What can I lose? Your name has been suggested to me by an old friend of yours, Mr. Leyland, a certain Snipey Jackson. Oh, Snipey Jackson. Don't tell me they've let that guy out again. <laughs> May I sit down? Sure, sure, make yourself at home. You wouldn't like a first-class hangover. Uh, not just at the moment, Mr. Leyland. <sighs> well, what can I do for you? How would you like to earn 200 pounds, Mr. Leyland, in a quarter of an hour? Okay. Let's have it. Your friend, Mr. Jackson, informs me that you are able to impersonate people to, what shall we say, pass yourself off as an entirely different personality. My friend, Mr. Jackson, talks too much. However, go on. 
Tonight, Mr. Leyland, I would like you to visit a public house in Limehouse called the Marquis of Bood and introduce yourself to a certain Mr. Paul Temple as Captain O'Hara, Captain Michael Sean Doherty O'Hara, skipper of the Simon Lee. Go on. Mr. Temple will ask you a number of questions. He will ask you, for instance, what exactly you know about a person called Valentine. In answer to that question, you will tell him a story. A rather interesting but purely fictitious story about a certain Sir Gilbert Dryden, about a woman in Amsterdam, about a mysterious parcel, and about an address in Estonia Avenue. In other words, I meet this guy Temple, introduce myself as this Captain O'Hara, and tell him exactly what you want me to tell him. That's right, Mr. Leyland. Uh, what's he like to look at? O'Hara, I mean. Oh, don't worry about your appearance. Temple has never met O'Hara. Just be Irish. Excitable. You know the type. Ah, uh, to be sure, I know the type backwards. If it's Captain O'Hara you be wanting. You can have the gentleman. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> Mr. Leyland. Excellent. Well, if it's that good, brother, it'll cost you 250. Well, there you are. That's the whole story. I turned up at the Marquis of Bude, dished out the Captain O'Hara act, and boy, I bet you fell for it. Indeed. Yes, Mr. Leyland. In fact, my wife and I went so far as to visit 479 Estonia Avenue. <laughs> no kidding. And do you know what we found at 479 Estonia Avenue, Mr. Leyland? No. We found the dead body of the real Captain O'Hara. What? I, I don't believe it. You're kidding. What was this man, Charles Kelvin, like? He was about 28 or 9, dark. Good-looking sort of guy, I guess. He spoke with an accent. Yes, yes, that's Kelvin. Mr. Temple... Was that on the level about the real Captain O'Hara? Yes. What happened to him? Don't you know? No. No, oh, no, I swear I don't. He was murdered. Murdered? Gee. Gee, now, now, now don't get me wrong. I'm no soft-hearted lily. Play a guy for a sucker, that's okay, that's fine. But, but murder? Murder? That's a different kettle of fish. Mr. Leyland, tell me, why did you meet Sir Gilbert Dryden tonight at the San Chow? Oh, well... That's the other side of the story, Mr. Temple. You see... Say, but just a minute. When that waiter spoke to me in the restaurant, he said, there's a Mr. Kelvin would like to see you, sir, in the entrance hall. That's right. I told him to say that. You did? Yes. You see, Mr. Leyland, I knew that if I said the name Temple, you wouldn't want to see me. And secondly... Yeah? Secondly, I just wondered if by any chance the name Charles Kelvin meant anything to you. Well, it did. And now you know why it did. Yes. I take it that you'd heard of Kelvin before. Yes, I've uh, heard of Mr. Kelvin. Okay. Well, now I'll tell you the rest of my story. In other words, why I met Sir Gilbert Dryden tonight. The first time I met this guy was exactly 24 hours ago. Last night? Yeah, I popped into the San Chao for a bite to eat at about, uh, about a quarter after seven. And... Alone? No, I had a dame with me. Maisie Bell. What a name and what a gal. Hey, she could talk. She started at five minutes past seven, and at ten minutes to eight, she hadn't even changed gear. So I said to Alice, I said, my God, crikey, Alice, is the first dress I've had in six months. I mean, you can hardly expect it. Are you listening? Sure, sure. We could hardly expect a girl in my position, I said, to go about in rags. My oh, goodness gracious me, Alice, I said, it isn't as if I had alimony pouring in on me from the four corners of the earth, and <clears throat> then... Uh, excuse me, sir. Hmm? Oh. Uh, what is it? Uh, the gentleman in the corner says he would appreciate it if you could spare him a few moments, sir. Where? Which gentleman? In the corner, sir. Oh. Who is he? Do you know? It's Sir Gilbert Dryden, sir. Oh. Okay, okay, tell him I'll be right over. But just a minute. No funny business. What do you mean? But I don't want to be stuck with a check. <sighs> don't be silly. <sighs> okay, waiter. I got your message. What's it all about? Mr. Leyland? Yeah? My name is Dryden. Sir Gilbert Dryden. Won't you sit down, Mr. Leyland? Thanks. I'm sorry if I interrupted a tete-a-tete, -tete, but... Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, would you care for a cigar? Well, thanks. I called at your flat, Mr. Leyland, but the porter said that you were out. Oh, this, this is rather a lucky coincidence. 
Yeah? I can see that you don't entirely trust me, Mr. Leyland. Shall we get to the point? I'm told that for a certain consideration you do a very remarkable impersonation of a certain Captain O'Hara. Who told you that? Mr. Kelvin. Go on. I, um, I'd like to put a proposition to you, Mr. Leyland, but I find myself in rather a difficult position. What is the proposition? Well, listen, you can set your mind at rest, brother. If the proposition doesn't interest me, I shall forget it. <laughs> I see you get the point. Well, briefly, Mr. Leyland, the proposition is this. In the early hours of Saturday morning, that's uh, the day after tomorrow, an aeroplane will arrive from the continent. It will land at a quiet, secluded spot near, well, near a certain village in Sussex. The pilot of the aeroplane will have a package... A large and rather important package, Mr. Leyland. He has agreed to hand that package over to... to Captain O'Hara. And you want me to be Captain O'Hara? If you please, Mr. Leyland. Has this guy, the airplane guy, ever seen the real Captain O'Hara? Uh, once. A long time ago. But that shouldn't present any difficulties. It'll be quite dark when the plane arrives. So far as you are concerned, it will simply mean a brief conversation with the pilot and the handing over of the package. Then what do I do? Bring the package back to London? No. You'll um, simply deliver it to an address in the village. I see. But tell me, why can't the real Captain O'Hara... The real Captain O'Hara is regrettably indisposed. Okay. How much? What did Mr. Kelvin pay you? Three fifty. <laughs> he paid you two fifty, Mr. Leyland. However, on this occasion, as you say, it shall be three fifty. Okay. It's a deal. Then meet me here tomorrow night, and I'll give you your instructions. At, uh, eight o'clock? At eight o'clock, Mr. Leyland. And that's the truth, Mr. Temple. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So if you don't believe me, brother, it's just too bad. I believe you, Leyland. But listen. When the waiter came across to you tonight and said that I wanted, or rather Mr. Kelvin wanted, to see you in the entrance hall, did Sir Gilbert hear him? No. Are you sure of that? I don't think he did. You see, we'd more or less finished our conversation anyhow, and I was just about to leave. The conversation hadn't lasted very long, Mr. Leyland. I thought you were going to have dinner together. Not that I know of. He simply handed me this envelope and said, you'll find your instructions inside, Mr. Leyland. Have you opened the envelope? <laughs> now, I ask you, what chance have I had to open the envelope with that howitzer of yours staring me in the face? Okay, we'll dispose of the automatic. There's a map in here, by the look of things. Uh, I don't see any sign of the 350. Hello, what's this? The plane will land at approximately 2.30 a.m. at the spot marked on the enclosed map. Take the package and deliver it immediately. And deliver it immediately to St. Nicholas Brasham. Do you know the place? Fairly well. It's near Windlesea. There's a stretch of sand over on the other side of Brasham. I bet a fiver that's where the plane's going to land. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, it is. Look. Look, you can see it marked on the map. Now, listen. You go straight through the village of Brasham for about a mile and a half. On the left-hand side, facing the sea, you'll see the sand dunes. The place where the plane's due to land is about 300 yards up on the right. You can't mistake it. It's the only possible... Uh, I say, just a minute, brother. Just a minute. You still want me to go through with this business? Yes. I want you to collect the package from the plane and deliver it to St. Nicholas. But what is St. Nicholas? I don't know. But I should imagine that the gentleman who hands over the package will probably put you wise on that point. Well, yeah, you know, I'm not so sure that I want to go through with this proposition. If anything happens to me and your friends from Scotland Yard... My friends from Scotland Yard won't interfere with you, Mr. Leyland. All you have to do is pick up the package from the plane, deliver it, and collect the 350. Okay. Okay, if you say so, Mr. Temple. What is it, Steve? Paul. Sheila Baxter's just arrived, and she seems to be in rather a state about something. Sheila Baxter? Yes, she's in the dining room. All right. All right, Steve. Oh, and darling, mm -hmm. uh, ring through to Sir Graham for me. You've got the private number. Tell him I want to see him at the yard in 20 minutes. In 20 minutes? Yes. Well, uh, I'll beat it. Good night, Temple. I guess we'll meet again pretty soon. Paul, what's happening? Is Mr. Leyland... I'll explain later, Steve. Now, don't forget, Leyland. Play the whole thing perfectly straight, just the way they want it. Mm-hmm. It should take you about two hours to get down to Brasham, so I should leave town. Hello, Miss Baxter. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. 
I feel I'm making an awful nuisance of myself. Nothing of the sort. Of course you're not making a nuisance of yourself. Oh, hello, hasn't Steve given you a drink? Mr Temple, please listen to me. When I left here tonight and went back to my flat, I had a strange, rather uncomfortable sort of feeling. I felt that... Yes? I felt that somehow you didn't believe me. Didn't believe you, Miss Baxter? I mean that you didn't believe my story about Sir Gilbert. Is that why you came back here? Because... No. No, I... I came back here because... There's something I ought to have told you. About Sir Gilbert? No. No, about myself. Well? Mr Temple, you know what happened tonight? You know what happened downstairs when I got out of the lift? Yes. Well, I wasn't entirely taken by surprise. What do you mean? I mean that for days, for days now, I've thought that something like that might happen. That's why I've been so nervous, so jumpy, so... Why should you think that something like that might happen? Because... Well? Because... Almost everywhere I go, there's someone following me. At first, I wouldn't believe it. I, I just wouldn't believe it. I thought I was imagining things, but... This afternoon, I went shopping. He followed me, the same man. I'm sure I wasn't imagining things, Mr. Temple. I saw him. I saw him quite distinctly when I stepped in front of a shop window. And you think that it was this man that attacked you here tonight? Well, I... I think it must have been. I mean, he must have been waiting for me downstairs, near the elevator. What did he look like, the man that followed you this afternoon? Well, I'm not very good at describing people. He was tall, stout, rather an untidy individual. He had a brown overcoat, and I believe he carried a pair of dirty wash leather gloves. Did he stoop slightly and walk rather, rather aimlessly? Yes. Yes, he did. Well, I hardly think that he attacked you, Miss Baxter. Why? Why, do you know this man? Yes, yes, I know him. His name's Weatherby. He's a superintendent at Scotland Yard. I'm not so sure about Steve coming along with this temple. It seems to me that if by any chance those people There's get There's no out... argument about it, Sir Graham. I'm coming. Besides, I know the Bresham district a hundred times better than you people. I was at school there for two years. Yes, yes, my Timothy, I forgot all about that. Well, darling, do you remember a place called St. Nicholas? St. Nicholas? What sort of a place? Well, I don't know. There used to be a house called St. Nicholas. Where? It was over on the far side of Bresham, not far from a village called Kenverton. That sounds like the place, Temple. Yes. What sort of a place was it, Steve? Oh, very large. The house stood in a kind of park. I, I should say the park must have been 30 or 40 acres. Who did it belong to? Can you remember? Well, in those days it used to belong to a man called Leroy, Arthur Leroy, but I doubt very much whether it still does. What is it, Peters? I'm leaving now, sir. Right. Good night, Mrs. Temple. I expect we shall meet later. Good night, Major. You know what to do, Peters, if anything goes wrong. No, don't worry, Sir Graham. Nothing's going to go wrong. Not this time. Oh, uh, what about the superintendent, sir? A weatherby is following behind. Yourself and Turner in the first car, Mr. and Mrs. Temple and myself in the second, and then Weatherby. Oh. Oh, I see. Right. Good night, sir. Good night, Peters. Uh, there's no doubt in your mind about the district, Major. Oh, there's a very big doubt, Mr. Temple. In fact, I haven't the foggiest idea where the place is. Then how on earth do you hope to find it if you have Sergeant Turner knows it, Mrs. Temple. He knew the exact spot where the plane's likely to land the moment I mentioned Bresham. Good. Oh. Well, see you later, sir. Well, I suppose we'd better get down, Temple. Hmm. Are you driving, Temple, or would you like one of our drivers to do Steve's the... Steve's driving, Sir Graham. It's her car. I'm just leaving, Sir Graham. Oh. Oh, we're just coming down, Weatherby. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Temple. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Superintendent. Hello, Weatherby. I was talking to quite a friend of yours this evening. Oh, indeed, Mr. Temple? Madame de Briac. Madame de Briac? Oh, oh you mean Miss Baxter? Yeah, that's the young lady Mr. Calvin works for. Yes. Hmm. I've been keeping my eye on that young lady. Yes. Yes, so I hear, Superintendent. Come along, Steve.
What was that last place we went through? I think it must have been Stonedale Temple. I noticed no, a signpost about... No, it wasn't Stonedale, Sir Graham. We don't go through Stonedale, not no. this way. Slow down, darling. We've plenty of time. Is that clock right? No, it's about a quarter of an hour fast. It's just gone half past one. How far do you reckon we've got to go, Steve? About another 15 miles or so, Sir Graham. If I remember rightly, there's a bridge about two or three hundred yards further on. You seem to have left Weatherby behind, all right. I noticed his headlights about ten minutes ago, just before we went through the village. Yes. Yes, so did I. You can tell we're getting near the sea. Yes. Is this Weatherby? Where? There's a car coming up behind, isn't there? I don't think so. Well, if there is, he hasn't got any lights. I thought I heard something. No, no, I don't think so. Yes. Yes, I think there is a car, Temple. Well, he must have switched his lights out. The silly ass. Is it Weatherby? No, no, it's not Weatherby. Although it's difficult to see. Well, here's the bridge. I'd better slow up. Or I... Oh, oh look out! He's passing! Pull over, you. darling. <laughs> look out! Damn fool! Oh, what's he trying to do? Hold on, Steve. Hold uh, right. Uh, Don't let him oh. force you over. He's, he's trying to force us over the bridge. Hold on, Steve. Hold on. Now, quickly, quickly. Let him have it. Let him have it. Oh. Oh. My God! He's going over the top. Break! Break! Break, Steve! Oh. 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 Are you all right, Steve? Uh, yes, I'm all right. We've got to be careful how we get out of here, Temple. We're halfway over the parapet already. Yes. I think you'd better get out first, Temple. Yes. It's all right. The car's wedged against the wall. I'll give you your hand, Steve. Now, be careful. Can you manage, Steve? Yes. Now, take it steady. That's it. Here's Weatherby. Oh, Paul. Look at the other car. Look. You can see the driver. He's... Yes, darling. Don't look. Are you feeling all right, Steve? Yes. Yes, don't worry. I'm okay. Oh, Sir Graham, what happened? What the devil happened? Weatherby, listen. Go down to the other car. You can see where the driver is from here. If he's not too badly hurt, get him up here onto the bridge. Check his identity and then contact our local people. Yes, very good, sir. I'm afraid we've got to take your car, Weatherby. Ready, Temple? Yes, I'm ready, Sir Graham. Good. Come along, Steve. We've still got to get to Bresham. Are you sure this is the right road? Yes, it must be, Sir Graham. Well, I'm not so sure, Temple. What do you think, Steve? Yes, we're all right, Sir Graham. Carry on, darling. Straight on. Look. There's the sand dunes. Oh, yes. It seems hours since we left Weatherby. I wonder if Weatherby was able to identify the... What is it? What is it, Temple? I thought I saw a light on the road, is it? There it is. Somebody's flashing a torch. He's standing in the middle of the road, darling. It's Peter's. It's Peter's, Temple. Hello, Peter's. Hello, Sir Graham. Hello, Mr. Temple. You're rather later than I expected, sir. Yes, we had an accident. Have you seen Leyland? Uh, no, sir, I haven't seen Leyland, but... Uh... But what? What's happened, Peters? Well, the plane's here, sir. It was here when we arrived. When you arrived? Yes. There's something queer, Mr. Temple. Something damn queer about the whole business. What do you mean? Well, the plane was here on the sand. It looked all right, perfectly all right. Just as if he'd made a perfect landing, but... But we found the pilot in the cockpit, sir. He's in a terrible condition. Just as if he's been beaten up or something. Is she there now? Yes, sir. Come along. Let's have a look at him. Yeah, I don't think I'd bring Mrs. Temple, sir. No. No, you stay here, Steve. In the car. Yes. Yes, all right, darling. Here we are. Good evening, Sergeant. Good evening, sir. It's a nice-looking plane, Temple. Mm. All right, Peters. Let's have a look at the pilot. He's still in the cockpit, sir. Because I'm afraid we haven't been able to move him. Oh, my God, poor fellow. Sir Graham, I'm afraid this isn't the pilot. Isn't the pilot? What do you mean? Then who the hell is it? It's Mr. Leyland. What? Are you sure? It, it can't be Leyland. It's Leyland, all right. Here, give me a hand, Sir Graham. 
Let's have a look at him. We've sent for an ambulance, Sir Graham. We telephoned about 20 minutes ago. Good. Of course, the hospital people believe that he's the pilot, so... That doesn't matter, Peters. How is he, Temple? He's in a pretty bad way, Sir Graham. Oh, oh, oh. Now, take it easy, Leyland. We'll be all right, old boy. No, don't hit me. Don't hit me. For God's sake, don't, don't hit me. It's all right, Leyland. There's nothing to worry about. Don't hit me, please. Don't hit me. This is Temple, old boy. Paul Temple. I'm not going to hit you. Temple? T Temple? Here's a flask of brandy, Temple. Thanks. My Timothy suddenly taking a beating. Come here, Leyland. Try and drink this. That's a good fellow. That's better. <clears throat> Temple, listen. The plane was early, almost an hour early. The pilot was waiting for me. I, I went down to the plane and pretended to be O'Hara. He, he recognized me. Go on, Leyland. The swine had a truncheon, a rubber truncheon. I, I, I couldn't defend myself. I stood there and he, he hit me, Temple. He hit me, he hit me, he hit me. Here we are. Have another drink, Leyland. Oh, no, God, my head is almost bursting. I, I can't drink anymore. Come along. Better. Oh, Temple. Temple, if I pull through this, I got a whole heap of things to talk to you about. I, 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 oh. Here's the ambulance, Sir Graham. Oh. oh, good. No, just relax, Leyland. It's right as rain by tomorrow morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. West. Good morning, Doctor. Where's the patient? Uh, he's in the cockpit. Oh, oh I see. Are you the gentleman the telephone? Uh, no, Sergeant Turner. He telephoned you. My name is Peters, and this is Sir Graham Forbes, CID. Good morning, Doctor. Oh, oh, good morning, Sir Graham. Well, what's happened exactly? There's been an accident. We want you to get this man to hospital as quickly as possible. Ah, oh, I see. All right. We'll have a look at him. Can you see all right? Yes. I say, he's in a pretty bad way, isn't he? Does that hurt you, old Don't man? touch me. Don't touch me. Oh. Okay. I shall want my case now, so I'm going to give an injection. Yes, very good, Doctor. You'll find it on the front seat. Yes, Don't hit I... me. For God's sake, don't hit me. Uh, He'll be all right when we get him to the hospital. You'd better go back to the hospital with the doctor, Peters. Then if Leyland recovers and starts talking, we shall have somebody on hand. Yes. All right, Sir Graham. Here we are, Doctor. Thank you, Nurse. <clears throat> now... This isn't going to hurt you, so don't get nervous. What, what are you going to do? D don't, don't touch me. Don't. <sighs> now, if you'll give me a hand, sir, we'll get him down to the ambulance. Yes, certainly. Careful. Careful. Uh, watch his head. You want any help, Temple? No, it's all right. Think we can manage? That's right, nurse. Get the stretcher on the ground so that we can... That's it. That's fine. Steady, sir. Steady. There we are. Good. Sergeant, take Major Peters's car and report back to Brasham. You'll probably find Superintendent Weatherby there. Very good, sir. And keep the radio going, Sergeant, just in case we need you. Yes, sir. But what about the pilot, sir? He must still be somewhere in the district. We'll look for the pilot, Peters. You keep your eye on Leyland. It's my guess that when he comes to his senses, he'll spill the beans. So far as tonight's concerned, at any rate. I shouldn't be surprised, Sir Graham. Watch him, Peters. Stay with him all the time. Don't let the hospital people frighten you away. Leave that to me, sir. We're ready now, sir. Yes, very good, nurse. Oh, Doctor, do you know of a house around here called St. Nicholas? Uh, St. Nicholas, uh, yes, it's near Kenverton. Oh, thank you. Steve was obviously right. Yes. Come along, Sir Graham. Let's go back to the car. Did you think we were never coming, Steve? What's happened? I saw the ambulance drive They've past. They've taken Leyland thought... to the hospital. Leyland? But I thought Major Peters said that it was the pilot of the Major plane. Major Peters made a mistake. Quite a natural one, I'm afraid. What do you mean? Leyland was beaten up by the pilot and placed in the cockpit. Then what's happened to the pilot? Well, your guess is as good as ours. Well, my guess is that when he realized that Leyland wasn't a horror, and consequently, from his point of view, couldn't be trusted, he... He what? He made up his mind that the best thing he could do was to deliver the package himself. To the house known as St. Nicholas? Yes. I wonder. Well, Dashed old temple, he must have done. Why, of course, darling. Sir Graham, listen. 
Leyland's tough. He's as tough as nails. I'd back Leyland against anybody in a straight fight. But tonight, or rather this morning, if you want my opinion, it wasn't a straight fight. Well, yes, yes, we know that. He obviously started to do his Ahara impersonation. The pilot saw through it, realised he wasn't Ahara, and... And let him have it. Exactly. And you think that's what happened? Well, of course that's what happened. Leyland as good as said so. Yes, well, I'm glad you think so, because I don't. What do you mean? What do you think happened, darling? I think the pilot arrived, delivered the package, and then came back here and waited for Leyland. In other words, he never even expected O'Hara. He was forewarned. You mean that they knew all the time that Leyland was playing in with us? Yes. I hadn't thought of that. Well, don't you see? That's why the pilot was able to take Leyland completely by surprise. He never even expected O'Hara. But, Paul... Yes, Steve? If they knew that we know the truth about Leyland, then they also know that... That we know about the house, St. Yeah. Nicholas. Yes. Now I see what you're getting at. In other words, they expect us to go to the house. In other words, they're waiting for us. Yes. <laughs> And I'd have fallen for it. I'm afraid you would have done, Sir Graham. Then this means that we don't go to the house after all, darling. If we want to see this thing through, we've got to go to the house, Steve. But... But what? We go with our eyes open. I don't know how you're managing to keep the car on the road, Temple. Well, my luck and judgment, I'm afraid. There's a corner here, darling. Take it steady. How much further, Steve? Well, it can't be very much further. We've passed Kenverton. Hello, what's this place on the top of the hill? That's it. That's it, darling. Hmm. Pretty impressive sort of place. Hi, Timothy, it certainly is. Looks more like a medieval castle than anything else. Yes. Reminds me of that place at Inverdale, Scary Lodge. Just what I was thinking. It doesn't appear to be a light showing. No. What are you stopping the car for? What did you expect me to do, darling? Drive straight up to the front door? No, but you can get much nearer than this, Paul. The drive's about a hundred yards long. This is quite near enough, my sweet, for the time being. No, don't get out, Sir Graham. Hmm? I'm going to park the car on the side of the road. Oh. There's a good spot over there, Temple, near that gate. Yes. Now what do we do? Simply stroll up the... We? You stay here, darling, in the car. What? You'll be far more used to us here, Steve, than you will be up at the house. I quite agree. Give us about half an hour, Steve. Then if you don't see a light from one of the windows, you know the signal, darling. We've used it before. Contact Sergeant Turner. Yes, all right. You know how to work this, Steve? Yes, I think so. Calling DHO 838. Calling DHO 838. Calling DHO 838. Hello, Sergeant. Contact. Over to you. Superintendent Weatherby's here, Sir Graham. Oh, he is. Good. I'd like a word with Weatherby. Put the superintendent on, Sergeant. Superintendent Weatherby reporting, sir. This is Temple, Superintendent. Were you able to identify the man with the car, the man who tried to force us over the bridge? Yes, I had confirmation through from the yard about five minutes ago, sir. His name was Stoner. Lefty Stoner. Did he talk? He was dead when I reached him. Oh, oh, I see. Right. Thank you, Weatherby. Here's the Commissioner. Weatherby, I want you to telephone through to Major Peters at the hospital. If Leyland's been able to give Peters a description of the pilot, contact the car straight away. Yes, sir. Will you be there, sir? No. We're just outside Camberton, near the house called St. Nicholas. Oh. Oh, I see, sir. But Mrs. Temple's staying in the car. Keep in contact. Very good, sir. Goodbye, by the way. Ready, Sir Graham? Yes, I'm ready. Take care, darling.
Where's the dog? It's all right. I think it's over on the other side. Let's wait here a minute. We're in the shadow. Stand near the tree. Ten to one, they've spotted us by now. I don't know. There isn't a light showing. Are you okay? Yes. Yes, I'm all right now. Now, don't forget what I've told you, Sir Graham. Have you got the revolver? Yes. Keep me covered. And don't move until you see the torch. All right. But I still think you're taking a risk, Temple. Simply walking across the lawn towards the house. If, as we suspect, they're watching us, they won't know what I'm up to. They'll be curious. I'm pretty sure they won't do anything, not at first. Okay. Okay, I'm off. Watch yourself. I've got you covered. If they can't hear that, they can't hear anything. I thought you were trying to wake the dead. I'm not so sure that we're not barking up the wrong tree, Sir Graham. Hmm? You mean the house is empty? It's beginning to look like it. Have you tried the door? Yes, it's locked. Looks pretty solid to me. We never break that down even if we wanted to. There's a window over there, isn't there? Where? On the left. Oh, yes. Yes, I never noticed it. Is it unlatched? It is now. Good. Give me a leg up, Temple. Can you make it, Sir Graham? Yes, I, I, can, I can make it all right. Okay. Watch you don't fall backwards. I'm all right. Give me your hand. Steady. That's it. Nice work. Well, this part of the house looks completely deserted. It isn't even furnished. No. Do you smell anything, Temple? No. No, I don't think so. Oh, I, Why? I thought I could smell something. I noticed it outside. No, I can't smell anything. It's a pretty big room, this, isn't it? Yeah. Looks to me as if it might have been the library. Let's have a look at the rest of the house. This place isn't quite so impressive inside as out. No, it certainly isn't. That staircase is pretty dilapidated. It looks as if it's falling to pieces. You know, I've got a hunch we're in for rather a surprise, Sir Graham. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but... Listen. What is it? Don't you hear anything? No. Listen. Now do you hear it? Yes. It's upstairs. What is it? I don't know. But whatever it is, it's in the house. I can't hear it now. No, it stopped. Let's go upstairs. I wonder how many floors there are. I don't know. I should say there's certainly three. Oh, by Timothy, we're right about this staircase. The wood's absolutely rotten over on the... Sounds to me as if someone's gagged and... And they're trying to make themselves heard? That's exactly what it sounds like. Come on. on the top floor. No, no, I don't think so. 
It seems to me to be over here. Yes, I think you're right. Is there a room here? I don't know. Where's the torch? Here we are. It's all right. I'll hold it. Yes. Yes, there's a door. This is it, all right. There's someone in there. Is it locked? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in there? You were right, Temple. They're obviously gagged. Look out there. I'm breaking the door down. Show a light, Sir Graham, quickly. By Temple. By Timothy. It's Major Peters. Peters. What the devil are you doing here? You untie his legs, Sir Graham. I'll ungag him. Thank God you heard me. Oh, oh, my head. Peters, how the devil did you get here? We thought you were at the hospital with Leyland. You don't have to ask that question, Sir Graham. The damn doctor was a phony. As soon as we got out onto the open road, they let me have it. God knows what they hit me with. Oh, my head. You haven't got any of that brandy left, have you, Sir Graham? Yes, yes, here you are. Thanks. You can see what happened. They wanted to get Leyland away before he gave us a description of the pilot. They must have been on the verge of getting him away when Peters first arrived. They pushed him into the cockpit and waited. Then when the ambulance turned up, they waylaid the ambulance and drove down to the... What is it, Temple? What is it? Sir Graham, what did you think you could smell when you were downstairs? I don't know. Was it methylated spirits? It might have been. Mr. Temple, listen. I can smell burning. My God, you don't mean they've set the place on fire? Come on. They must have watched us. They must have watched us and waited until we got upstairs. Yes. My God, Temple. We'll never get down that staircase. It'll burn like matchwood. What are we going to do? I'm afraid there's only one thing we can do. We've got to go down the staircase. You'll never make it, Temple. I agree with Sir Graham. It's quite impossible. Well, if we don't go down the staircase, I'm afraid... That's torn it. We'll have to try and get out onto the roof. There's a window over here and... Where? Where? Here. Here we are. It's over here. Hello. What is it? There's a car coming up the drive. It must be Steve. Yes. Look out, Peters. Yeah. Steve! Steve! If only we had a rope. We could have a shot. There's yeah. another car. It's Weatherby and Sergeant Turner. Weatherby must have telephoned the hospital. Realised that Peters wasn't there. And then contacted... Look out, Peters! Stand over here, Peters. For God's sake, don't stand too near the staircase. Where are you? Where are you, Temple? But God, can't he see us? We're up here, Weatherby! Up here! You can do what you like, Temple. I'm going upstairs onto the next floor before this confounded... Wait floor. a minute. Temple! What is it? I've got a roll! Get ready to catch it! Good man. Look out, here it comes. Ah. Oh, damn, you've missed it. Try again! Here it comes. Here it comes. Oh, ah, good man. Well done, Temple. You've got it. Come on, Peters. Quickly. Out you go. No, you go first, Temple. There's no reason why I should be the... Come on, Peters. Don't argue. This isn't chapter two of the boy's own paper. We're in a spot, one hell of a spot, and we want to get out of it. You said it, Temple. Come on, Peters. Okay. <laughs> I hope you'll be all right. Darling, do be careful. You'll be all right, Steve. Watch the rope at the top, Temple. Watch it, Temple. Don't rush it. I wonder what he's tied the rope to. God knows. It didn't appear to be. Oh. Oh. Oh, phew. Oh. I thought he'd had it. So did I. Don't worry, Steve. He'll make it all right. He's over the worst part. Oh. Here he comes. Good man. Oh. oh, darling, darling. It's all right, Steve, it's all right. I feel exactly like Gary Cooper. 
Are you any better, Peterson? Yes, I feel much better now. Good. I suppose you telephoned the hospital, Weatherby, and discovered that Peters hadn't arrived. Yes. Oh, and I've got another little surprise for you, sir. What's that? We picked up Charles Kelvin. Huh? Kelvin? When? About five minutes ago. He was at the bottom of the drive. If you ask me, that young man was responsible for the bonfire. Well, where is he now? He's in the car, sir, with the sergeant. Let's have a word with him, Temple. Oh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Sergeant. Mr. Temple, Mr. Temple, please don't let them take me back to town. I can explain everything. Honestly, I can. I can. can you, Calvin? What are you doing down here? I... I came down here because... because Sir Gilbert Dryden told me that... That what? Sir Gilbert told me that if I came down to Bresham... If I came down to Bresham and met a friend of his called Mr. Leyland, he... he would pay me a hundred pounds. Did you meet Mr. Leyland? No. No, I've never seen the gentleman. Never seen the gentleman? Now, that's interesting, Mr. Kelvin. What do you mean? Didn't you persuade Mr. Leyland to impersonate a certain Captain O'Hara? Didn't you... Most certainly Didn't not. you persuade Mr. Leyland to meet me at a public house known as the Marquis of Bew? Of course not. I... I've already told you, I've never even... Look out! Look out, Sir Green! He's got a revolver! Why, you cunning little... <laughs> Nice work, Sergeant. I'm sorry about the revolver, sir, but I did search him. That's all right, Sergeant. Take him back to town. Oh. What time is it? It's just gone half past eleven. Good gracious. It's all right. We didn't get to bed till half past six. <laughs> Are you awake? Yes. Come in, Mary. I've brought you both a nice cup of tea. <laughs> Look, you deserve it now, coming in at that time of the morning. What sort of a day is it? Oh, it's a very nice day if you're partial to... Oh, <laughs> before I forget, there's a young lady to see you. She's in the lounge. Miss Baxter? Miss Baxter? Yes, all right, Mary. Mm -hmm. Pass me that dressing gown, darling. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Miss Baxter. Oh dear, didn't Mary offer you some coffee? Mr. Temple, Mr. Temple, forgive me calling at this, at this time of the morning, but... That's all right, Miss Baxter. But I think I've got some rather important news for you. Oh? Oh, indeed. Mr. Temple, I know the identity of Valentine. Valentine? Are you sure? Yes. Yes, I'm absolutely sure. My suspicions were justified, Mr. Temple. You mean that... I mean that... Sir Gilbert is Valentine. Sit down. Sit down, Miss Baxter. Now, what makes you so certain that Sir Gilbert is Valentine? When you saw my wife the other day, you said, if I remember correctly, that... Something's happened, Mr. Temple. Something happened this morning which utterly and completely convinces me that Sir Gilbert is Valentine. Go on. About an hour ago, I received a telephone message. I was asked to go round and see Sir Gilbert at his house in Berkeley Square. Yes? When I arrived at the house, Sir Gilbert was in the study. He wanted to see me about a private matter, as a matter of fact, about some shares which I inherited from my father. We were talking about the shares when suddenly... Yes? When suddenly the telephone rang. As soon as Sir Gilbert answered the phone, I knew that something was the matter. He was on edge, nervous, jumpy, rather, rather annoyed about something. Suddenly, without speaking a word, he put the telephone receiver down on the desk and walked through to the drawing room. There's an extension in the drawing room, so I knew that... That he wanted to talk privately? Yes. Go on, Miss Baxter. Well, to cut a long story short, I picked up the receiver and... and overheard the conversation. Go on. It was a man called Condre, Jules Condre. I'd never heard of him before, but, but I could tell immediately what they were talking about. Apparently, this man, Condre, had just arrived from the continent with a certain package. He told Sir Gilbert that he hadn't the slightest intention of handing over the package until he received the sum of 600 pounds. Did this man, Condre, seem annoyed, irritated? Extremely annoyed. He told Sir Gilbert that he knew exactly what had happened to a friend of his, a certain Captain... Captain... O'Hara? Yes. Go on. F 
From what I could gather, this man Condre had only just arrived in the country. He spoke as if he'd flown over from France in the early hours of this morning. He mentioned a place called... Oh, now, what was it? Bresham. Go on. Go on, Miss Baxter. Well, although he never actually referred to Sir Gilbert as Valentine, it was quite obvious from the conversation that he looked upon him as the leader of some sort of an organisation. He told Sir Gilbert that he would deliver the package tonight if... If what? If Sir Gilbert would agree to hand over the £600. What did Dryden say? He told Condre to meet him at eight o'clock. Where? At Berkeley Square? No. Condre wanted to come to the house, but Sir Gilbert wouldn't hear of it. He told him to meet him on platform number three. Platform number three? Which platform number three? Now, now, just a minute. Let me get this straight. Uh, Condre said, if you don't want to see me at the house, where the hell do you want to see me? And Sir Gilbert said, meet me on the underground, platform three, Piccadilly tube station. Tonight at... At eight o'clock? Yes. Thank you, Miss Baxter. Oh, Mr. Temple, I do hope I'm wrong about Sir Gilbert. I know he's changed, changed a great deal in the last two or three years, but... Uh, Miss Baxter, tell me, was this a trunk call, the one Sir Gilbert received from Condrey? Yes. Yes, I think it was. At any rate, I heard the pips. Mr. Temple, do you think I ought to have gone to Scotland Yard about this matter? No, I mean... no, you did the right thing, Miss Baxter, in coming to see me. Now, don't you worry about anything. Hello, Miss Baxter. Hello, Mrs. Temple. We're just having some tea. Wouldn't you like a cup? Well... Of course you would. It's all right, darling. I'll take that in the study. Hello? Mr. Temple? Yes? Well, hold the line, sir. Sir Graham wants you. You're through, sir? Hello, Temple. Hello, Sir Graham. Temple, listen. We're having a conference this afternoon, three o'clock. I'd rather like you to be there if you can manage it. Yes. Yes, that's all right, Sir Graham. Good. Any new developments? Well, I've been in touch with the French people this morning. They seem to think the pilot was a man called Condre, Jules Condre. Yes. Ah, I take it you've heard of Condre. Yes, I've heard of him, Sir Graham. I'll talk to you this afternoon. Yes, all right. Oh, I suppose you've seen the newspapers. No, I'm afraid I haven't. They splashed the Kelvin story right across the front page. Oh, have they? What do they say? The usual nonsense. The Daily Post seems to think we've caught the bird we're looking for. Valentine? Yes. I wish I could think so. I take it you don't think Mr. Kelvin is Valentine? Well, if he is, we can't prove it. Have you spoken to him? Yes. We had him up to the office this morning. He's changed, Temple. What do you mean? Oh, he's... he's tougher. A little more full of himself. Why, I wonder? I don't know. He didn't seem very sure of himself at half past two this morning, did he? Certainly did not. Anyway, you can see him for yourself if you'd like to. That's quite an idea. All right. Three o'clock. Three o'clock, Sir Graham, at Scotland Yard. If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, I don't know anything at all about a man called Condre. Condre, Mr. Kelvin. Condre. I went down to Bresham to see someone called Leyland. When I discovered that... Yes? When I discovered that Mr. Leyland was not to be found there, I... I decided to return to London. Is that why Superintendent Weatherby found you running away from the house? I told you! Sir Gilbert Dryden told me that Mr. Leyland was at the house. That's... That's the only reason why I went there. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Don't you believe me? Do you expect me to believe you, Mr. Kelvin? Oh, it's a matter of complete indifference to me whether you believe me or not. Indeed. Very good, Mr. Kelvin. All right, Sergeant. Take Miss Kelvin down to Superintendent Bradley's office. Very good, sir. Uh, this way, please, sir. <sighs> well, you didn't get much change out of that young man, Mr. Temple. No. You know... In spite of Sheila Baxter's story about Sir Gilbert Dryden, I've still got a hunch about Kelvin. What do you mean? Well, I shouldn't be at all surprised if he doesn't turn out to be Valentine after all. What makes you say that, Peters? Well, we know he's mixed up in this business. That's obvious, and yet... And yet, when you get down to brass tacks, we've got absolutely nothing on the boy. Exactly. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Peters. Don't forget the Charlie King affair. Hmm. He hasn't really given us a satisfactory explanation about the watch train. No. And I don't think he will either, Sir Graham. Why? 
Because in my opinion, he murdered Charlie King. Oh? Does that mean... Well, that's a change anyway, Temple. We don't often find ourselves in agreement with each other. Mm -hmm. Peters, tell me, what exactly is your opinion about this Valentine affair? Well, to be quite frank, my opinion has changed rather a great deal, especially during the past two or three days. When I first started to investigate this business, I was under the impression that the whole affair was run, organized, and completely controlled by one person, Valentine. Now, however, I'm not so sure. <sighs> Whichever way you look at it, it simply boils down to the fact that we're up against a, a definite criminal organization, an organization on quite an unprecedented scale. That sounds exactly like a line out of one of my novels, Superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your opinion, Temple? Well, Peters, I'll tell you. It's my belief that there exists in or near London a central depot, a sort of clearinghouse, if you like. Whenever any drugs, narcotics, are smuggled into the country, they eventually find their way to this central depot. At this depot, contact is made, and the drugs are eventually distributed all over the country. Now, you know, Sir Graham, we all know from past experience, that it's a great mistake to assume that the drug habit exists only in a certain section of the community. A drug addict isn't necessarily a wealthy person, and because yeah, of... But he it, must be wealthy, Temple. Otherwise, he'd never be able to buy this but stuff. But that's the point. He doesn't always buy it. What do you mean? Sometimes it's given to him for services rendered. Oh, now I see what you're getting at. You mean that the whole of the organisation is controlled by about three or four people? The petty, unimportant, but risky little jobs are undertaken by outsiders. Drug addicts. People who would risk anything in order to satisfy their cravings. Precisely. You mean people like the man who impersonated the doctor? Like the girl who impersonated the nurse? Exactly, like... Peters. Well, in that case, how does Valentine fit into the picture? Quite easily, Peters. Valentine is the man behind the scenes, the big noise, the mysterious hand... Oh, the... no. No, I don't think so, Sir Graham. What do you mean? I think that's the extraordinary part about this affair. I don't think Valentine is the mysterious man behind the scenes... Certainly not so far as the other people are concerned. You mean that the identity of Valentine is actually known to the other members of the organisation? Yes. Yes, I'm pretty sure it is, Weatherby. Temple, what do you think happened down at Bresham? Well, your guess is as good as mine, Sir Graham. But if you want my opinion, Dryden contacted Leyland and offered him £350 to go down to Bresham and collect a parcel from the pilot of a plane... A man called Jules Condré. When I picked up Leyland at the San Chow restaurant, Dryden realised that something was the matter, wireless Condré, and told him to turn up at Bresham an hour or so earlier than was originally planned. Condré did this and waited for Leyland. Go on. Now, this is the interesting point. In my opinion, Dryden intended that Condré should beat up Leyland and then depart to the house, St Nicholas. At the house, it was intended that he should hand over the package to Charles Kelvin. Yes. But when Leyland spoke to Condre, he impersonated O'Hara. Now, it's my opinion that Dryden hadn't said anything about this to Condre. This made Condre think. He came to the conclusion, quite correctly, that his friend O'Hara had been done away with, and that if he turned up at the house... My God, that fire! It must have been prepared for Condre! Exactly. Condre changed his plan, probably stayed the night on the sand dunes, and the small... Telephone Sir Gilbert. Yes. It fits together, all right, Temple. It fits together like a jigsaw, but... It points to Dryden. Yes. Well, if Dryden does turn up tonight, if Dryden meets Condre, then by God, he's Valentine, and you'll never convince me otherwise, Sir Graham. I shan't try, Weatherby. Don't worry about that. And I say, this business is going to mess your night up, isn't it, Weatherby? Oh, it can't be helped. Had you other plans for this evening? Here's my daughter, sir. She's making her debut tonight, as you might say. She's in the new play at the Queen's. First time she's been in the West End. Oh. Oh, well, I hope she'll have a big success, Weatherby. No, thank you. If it's a dramatic part, I feel sure she'll uh, ring the bell. <coughs> uh, yes, sir. What is it, Sergeant? Uh, I've been through to O-Division, sir. All arrangements are complete for this evening. Good. You've notified Harper and the flying squad people? Yes, sir. All right, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. Well, this is it. Yes. I'll pick you up at seven o'clock, Temple.
time do you make it, Temple? It's nearly ten to eight. I think I'd contact Rogers again, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I don't know why, but I feel as nervous as a kitten. I hope there aren't going to be any slip-ups, Temple. I don't see why there should be. You've got a man watching each entrance to the tube, I take it? Yes, yes. I'm not worried about that side of it. Once he gets inside the cordon, he'll never get out again. Where's Weatherby? He's at the top, near the first escalator. As a matter of fact, he's collecting the tickets. And Peters? Peters is on the lookout for Condre. He's actually on the platform. Good. Calling KCD 842. Calling KCD 842. KCD 842 reporting. Contact. Over to you. A man answering to the description of Sir Gilbert Dryden left the house in Berkeley Square just over six and a half minutes ago. I will repeat that. A man answering to the description of Sir Gilbert Dryden left the house in Berkeley Square just over six and a half minutes ago. What's he dressed in, Rogers? He's dressed in a blue suit, dark overcoat, black Homburg hat, and he's carrying a light brown valise. I will repeat that. He's dressed in a blue That's suit. That's Dryden, all right. Dark yes. Overcoat, black he's Homburg on his way. Hat, and he's carrying a okay, light brown Sergeant. Valise. Okay, Rogers. Report back to headquarters. Please. Do I change for Euston? Uh, no, straight through. Thank you. Uh, tickets, please. Where's Peters? On the platform? Yes. Dryden should be here at any minute now. He left the house almost ten minutes ago. Good. You've told Peters to do nothing until he actually contacts Conway. Yes. Tickets, please. Tickets, please. You make a very good ticket collector, Weatherby. Glad you think so, Mr. Temple. Isn't that Dryden? Where? Over on the other side, near that machine. Yes. Yes, that's him. OK, get down to the platform, Temple. Warn Peters. Watch those stairs. If he makes a dash for it, he might try and get back this way. It'll be just the same if he does. There's a man on every exit. Hello, Temple. Hello, Peters. He's on his way down. Oh, OK. Have you seen Condre? Well, I've seen the man I think is Condre. He's at the other end of the platform. Is there anyone down there? Yes, Crane and Bradley. It's a great pity there are so many people on the platform. Yeah, here's the fellow, I mean, strolling up the platform. The chap with the attaché case. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. That looks like Condre. He's perhaps a little younger than I imagined he would yes, be. Yes, Dryden. OK. Now watch him. Pardon me, Monsieur Condre. Where? My name is Dryden. Ah, yes. Yes, I've been expecting you. Sir Gilbert. Good evening. Have you got the pack? It is here, in the case. Why didn't you go to the house at Brasham? Don't you know why I didn't go to the house, my friend? Now listen, Condre. The next time you receive instructions from Instructions? Your <laughs> I don't receive instructions from anyone, my friend. Not even from you. So if you don't mind, who is that man behind you? Where? Sir Gilbert Dryden. Yes? My name is Peters. Major Peters of the CID. This is Superintendent Bradley and Inspector Crane. We have a warrant for the arrest. Don't move! Stand back! Don't move, any of you! Oh, 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 Watch Dryden, Peters! Don't let him get away! Stand back! If anyone moves, by God, I'll let him have it! Watch him, Mr. Temple! He's desperate! Country, listen! Don't be a fool! Don't come near me! Do you hear that? Don't come near me! Brutal Alpha! You fool! You stupid damn! Take your, Take your hands off me! Take your hands off me! Take your hands off me, you swine! Ah, 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 look out, sir! He's falling off the platform! Look out! Look out! Don't panic! Don't panic! Keep still! For God's sake, keep still! Where's Dryden? Where the hell's Dryden? I thought he was with you! He was! I was standing next to him! I was holding his arm when suddenly... There he is! He's trying to get through onto the other platform! Bradley, quick! Quick, Bradley! Now stop him, Bradley, for God's sake! Don't let him get on the train! Out of the way! Out of the blast! Be quick! Be quick, Bradley! Thank you, Rivergate! Thank you, everybody! Thank you! There he is! There he is, Bradley! Be quick! Oh, my God, he's made it! He's made it, Peters! He's on the train. Hello? Hello? Ah, 
Listen, this is Forbes speaking. I've just received your message. I don't give two hoots in hell what the security people say. I want a special announcement, and I want it now. We interrupt our programmes this evening to bring you a special announcement from Sir Graham Forbes, Chief Commissioner of Police, New Scotland Yard. Listeners in the London area are requested to be on the lookout for Sir Gilbert Dryden, believed to be the notorious Valentine, leader of the mysterious criminal... Hello, Mary. Oh, good evening, sir. Is Mrs. Temple in? Uh, yes, sir. She got back from Eve from about an hour ago. Oh, good. You'll find her in the lounge, sir, with Miss Baxter. Oh. oh thank you, Mary. Oh, hello, Paul. Hello, darling. Hello, Miss Baxter. What happened? What happened tonight at... He escaped. Oh, it was one hell of a mix-up. There's been an announcement about Dryden on the radio. They interrupted the news. Yes, I know. What's going to happen? They're watching every tube station in the town. And I've still got a hunch he'll get away with it. You look done in. Well, it hasn't exactly been a picnic. What does Sir Graham think about it? Sir Graham? Oh, don't mention Sir Graham. Poor old Peters. He's certainly in hot water. But what happened exactly? Well, Condre made a dash for it, pulled a gun, and then we had just one beautiful panic. During the excitement, Dryden slipped onto the next platform and jumped onto a train. But couldn't you have stopped the train, Mr. Temple? Well, I could have thrown an atomic bomb at it, I suppose, but... I'm sorry. It's all right. Well, I suppose I'd better be going. No, no, don't go. Not yet, Miss Baxter. Here we are, darling. Here's a drink. Thanks. Ah, oh, that's better. I'm glad you're here, Miss Baxter. I wanted to have a word with you. I really don't know why I came here, Mr. Temple. I was so jumpy and nervous and terribly on edge, I just couldn't sit still. I knew, of course, after what I told you this morning, that you'd try and arrest Sir Gilbert, but... You took it for granted that we should succeed. I wish we had, Miss Baxter. If only for your sake. What do you mean? What do you mean, darling? I don't want to frighten you, Miss Baxter, but it's my belief that until Sir Gilbert Dryden is arrested, you're in rather an unfortunate position. Why? Why do you say that? He realises by now that someone discovered his arrangements, his arrangements to meet Condre, and went straight to Scotland Yard. He'll remember that telephone call this morning, and he'll remember... Leaving me alone in the study? Yes. Paul, do you think he's dangerous? Do you think he'll make an attempt to... Well, you know what Mrs Temple was going to say? I think you've got to watch yourself, Miss Baxter. I shall sleep with my door locked and a very large hammer underneath my pillow. <laughs> Where do you live, Miss Baxter? I have a flat, well, I suppose you'd call it a maisonette, in Kenilworth Mansions, just off Park Lane. Oh, yes. Well, come along, we'll take you home. And give it the once over. Oh, really, there's no need to put... Excuse me. Hello? Hello, Temple. Oh, hello, Sir Graham. I'm sorry to disturb you, but... I thought you'd like to know that I've attended to that little matter. Oh, oh, have you? It's quite settled, quite definitely. Good. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Oh. Well, thanks for ringing, Sir Graham. That's all right. Goodbye. Goodbye. That sounds very mysterious, darling. Well, I suppose I oughtn't to tell you this, really. But they've released Charles Kelvin. Oh, I'm glad. Yes, so am I. I never really thought that he was mixed up in this business. He's mixed up in it, all right. But unfortunately, we can't prove anything. Still, he isn't Valentine. We do know that. Or do we? Oh, well. Come along, Miss Baxter. Here we are. 
Oh, isn't it charming? Isn't it a lovely flat, Paul? Precisely what I expected. Now I wonder how I'm supposed to take that. Oh, I see. This is the dining room over here. It's quite small. There's just the two rooms. Lounge and dining room and two bedrooms upstairs. Miss Baxter, has Sir Gilbert ever been here? No. No, I don't think he has. He must know that I live here, though, because he telephoned... What is it? Why? Why, there's someone upstairs. You sure? Yes, sir. Have you a maid? Or... Yes, I have a maid, but she's away ill. She's been away for two weeks. Where's the staircase? It's through that door over... Mr. Temple, Mr. Temple, do you think it's Sir Gilbert? Because, because whoever it is, they're coming downstairs. Yes, now don't move, Miss Baxter. Stay where you are. But Paul... Stand still, darling. Oh, hello, Mr. Temple. I didn't expect to find you here. No, Superintendent Weatherby. You never do, do you? You have been listening to the seventh episode of A Case for Paul Temple, a serial in eight episodes by Francis Durbridge with Crawford Logan as Paul Temple and Garda Stevenson as Steve. Others taking part were Richard Greenwood, Melody Grove, John Paul Hurley, Eliza Langland, Michael McKenzie, Greg Powery, Simon Tate, Gareth Thomas and Nick Underwood. The production for the BBC was by Patrick Rayner. We present Crawford Logan as Paul Temple and Gerda Stevenson as Steve in A Case for Paul Temple, a serial in eight episodes by Francis Durbridge. Episode 8, in which Paul Temple meets Valentine. Paul Temple, the celebrated novelist and private detective, is invited by Sir Graham Forbes, the Chief Commissioner of Scotland Yard, to investigate the activities of a drug smuggling organization under the leadership of a notorious criminal known simply as Valentine. Whilst working on the case, with Superintendent Weatherby and Major Peters, Temple makes the acquaintance of a Sir Gilbert Dryden, a Mr. Charles Kelvin, and a Miss Sheila Baxter. Sheila Baxter tells Temple that, in her opinion, Sir Gilbert is definitely Valentine, and an unsuccessful attempt is made by Scotland Yard to arrest Sir Gilbert Dryden. Later the same night, Miss Baxter received an unexpected visitor. What is it? Why? Why, there's someone upstairs. You sure? Listen. Have you a maid? Or... Yes, I have a maid, but she's away ill. She's been away for two weeks. Where's the staircase? It's through that door over... Mr. Temple... Mr. Temple, do you think it's Sir Gilbert? Well, because... whoever it is, they're coming downstairs. Yes, now don't move, Miss Baxter. Stay where you are. But Paul... Stand still, darling. Why, hello, Mr. Temple. I didn't expect to find you here. No, Superintendent Weatherby. You never do, do you? <laughs> Although I bet a fiver were both here for the same reason. What is your reason, Weatherby? Well, sir, I figured it out this way. In view of what's happened tonight, Sir Gilbert Dryden isn't going to feel particularly friendly towards Miss Baxter. It's my bet that he'll turn up here oh, and... Oh, uh, and you wanted to make certain... That... that he hadn't already done so. Exactly. He might have made a beeline for this place. Oh! Oh, it's all right, miss. The flat's quite empty. You've nothing to worry about. Well, I... I don't know about that. You're all making me feel particularly nervous. Miss Baxter, why don't you collect a few things and spend the night with us? We've got a spare room. That's an awfully good could... idea, Steve. Now, why on earth didn't we think of that before? No, really. It, it was silly of me. I'll be all right. In any case, if I don't want to stay here, I can always go to a friend of mine and... Who's that? I haven't the faintest idea. I'll take it. No, no, let Miss Baxter take it. Hello? Yes? 
Yes. Yes. Yes, I've told you. This is Grosvenor 7296. I haven't the vaguest idea who it is. What? Who is that? Who? Oh, Sir Gilbert. Here, let me have it. Quickly. Listen, Dryden. If you've got any sense... Damn! What's happened? He's rung off. Did he say anything? No. No, he must have heard my voice when I took the phone from Miss Baxter. I wonder if we can trace the call. He was in a call box. I heard him press the button. Oh, what did he say? What did he say exactly? Well, I, I don't really know what he said. I, I couldn't understand him at first. In fact, I didn't even recognise him. What do you mean? Well, to be quite honest, he sounded to me almost as if... Well, it, as if he was drunk. But he must have said something. Well, when I picked the phone up, he said, Is that Grosvenor 7296? And I said, Yes. And then he said, is that Grosvenor 7296 again? And I said, yes. And then for the life of me, I don't know why, but he repeated the question. You know, I'm sure he was drunk. He must have been drunk. Go on. And then what did he say? Well, then, when I asked him who it was, he said, Sheila, this is Gilbert. Thanks. <sighs> now, don't get upset, Miss Baxter. Come along. I think you'd better come back to the flat with us. No. No, I'm staying here. I shall be perfectly all right. It's silly of me to get like this. I'm... I'm terribly sorry. Are you sure you'll be all right? Yes, yes, honestly. I'm not a bit nervous now. Really, I'm not. Well, if you say so, Miss Baxter. Come along, Steve. Uh, you've got my number, just in case. Yes, yes, I've got your number, and thanks for everything. Nonsense, my dear. Ready, Superintendent? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm ready, sir. <sighs> now, you've no need to worry, Miss Baxter. I'm planting one of my best men outside on the landing. He'll be there all night. If he hears any funny business, he'll be in here like a streak of lightning. Oh, thank you, Superintendent. So, you have nothing to worry about. This Valentine guy might be pretty smart, but he's not exactly the invisible man, is he, Mr Temple? Not exactly, Superintendent. Good night, Miss Baxter. Good night. Good night, Mrs Temple. Good night. Good night, Superintendent. Good night, Miss. Ah, there you are, Sergeant. Evening, sir. Superintendent Bradley told me to report. Yes, yes, that's right, Sergeant. Shan't keep you a moment, Mr Temple. That's all right, Weatherby. Now, listen, Sergeant. This is Miss Baxter's flat, flat B17. Now, I don't know whether Bradley The is... superintendent gave me my instructions, sir. Oh, good. I take it this is uh, an all-night job, sir. Yes, I'm afraid it is, Hodson. I'll try and get some sandwiches sent up to you. There's a, a service restaurant on the ground floor. Oh, I'd be obliged if you would, sir. Yes, all right, Sergeant. Good night. Good night, sir. I'm ready, Mr Temple. Weatherby ordered the sandwiches for? That's right. Sergeant Hodson. Ah, well. Yeah. Don't make a beast of yourself. Sure. What'd you call this? Mustard and cress? No. Chicken. Oh. Paste. Oh. What are you doing up here on the landing anyway? Haven't they told you? We're expecting a murder. A murder? That's right. Cock Robin. <gasps> Cock Robin. Oh, sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Chicken. Blimey, if this is... Strumpf! Open up here! Open up! Get this... Oh, door! Oh, open! It's okay, Miss Baxter! It's okay! Please, help! Oh, oh, he's, he's gone upstairs. Be careful. Be careful, he might be behind that door. Which door? Over there. Be careful. Stand behind me, Miss Baxter. Now, do you hear me? Come out. Do you hear me, you swine? Come out. I'm going to open the door, and if you don't... The 9th of 
in the middle town will lead to platform 10, called the Wendell Key, Timber, Ratcliffe and Hope. Passengers for Ratcliffe, travel at the rear of the train. I should put that case up on the top, Harry. That's it. Good evening. Is this the left luggage office? Yeah, well, it's not the Palace of Arise, brother. Of course. How stupid. What can we do for you? I I left a case here about a week ago. A small brown case. You got the ticket? Yes. Ta. What name? Kelvin. Here we are. Here we are, mate. That'll cost you... Keep the change. Oh. Oh, thanks, China. Where to? I want you to take me to the Esplanade Hotel. The Esplanade? No, let's see, that's just off Regent Street, isn't it? That's right. Okay. Here, here, just a minute, mate. Not so fast. I want you to follow that cab in front. Now, don't lose sight of him. You understand? Here, just a minute, mate. Just... My name's Bradley. Superintendent Bradley. CID. Oh. Oh. Okie doke. Okie doke. Messages? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir Graham Forbes telephoned a few minutes ago. Oh, and uh, Major Peters is here, sir. He's just arrived. Major Peters? Uh, yes, ma'am. What did Sir Graham want? He asked me to deliver a message to you, sir. He said it was very important. Yes? He said, tell Mr. Temple it looks as if it might be the Esplanade. The Esplanade? But that was the hotel. Right. Where... Thank you, Mary. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Come along, darling. Let's see what Major Peters wants. Ah. Hello, Temple. Hello, Major. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Oh, that's all. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Temple. Good evening, Major. Would you like a drink? Uh, no. No, I don't think so, sir. Not just at the moment. As a matter of fact, I just dropped in to show you this. I thought you might be interested. What is it? It's a report on Lefty Stoner, sir. It came through on the teleprinter from our Newcastle people. Lefty Stoner? Oh. Oh, that was the man who tried to force us over the bridge. Yes. I, uh, I think it's what you've been looking for. Oh. Oh, is it? <laughs> well, judge for yourself. Yes. Yes, I should think this is it, all right. I see he was with the D Electrical Company for seven years. Yes. That's a nasty scratch you've got, Major. Hmm? Oh. Oh, yes. I had a choice, Mrs. Temple. Either a scratch, or be pushed completely off the platform. It certainly was a scrimmage. <laughs> right, thank you, Peters. Good night, Mrs. Temple. Good night, Major. It's all right. It's all right, old boy. I can let myself out. Well, what was all that about, darling? You heard? It was about a man called Lefty Stoner. Uh, no, no, don't take your things off, Steve. We're going out again. Out? Where? And to the Esplanade. The Esplanade? Paul, what did Sir Graham mean by that message? The message uh, Not he's... now, darling. Come along, we haven't a moment to lose. We've got to get Paul, out. Paul, please. Darling, what's this all about? You remember the Esplanade? Oh, yes, of course I remember it. It's the hotel where we had dinner the first night this business started. The night... Well, the night that girl disappeared. The night we bumped into Superintendent Weatherby. Yes. But, Paul, why do you want to go to the Esplanade tonight? Because? Well... Because I've got a hunch that Valentine is going to be there. Valentine? But... But Sir Gilbert wouldn't turn up at a hotel. Not when he realises the whole of Scotland Yard. Not Sir Gilbert, darling. Valentine. What do you mean? What do you mean? I mean that Sir Gilbert Dryden isn't Valentine. Isn't? Then... Then who is? Paul. Paul. Who... Is Valentine. Don't you know? Don't you know, Steve?
What are you pulling up here for, darling? This isn't the Esplanade. The Esplanade's over on the corner. Yes, Steve, I know. The... Ah, here he is. Who is it? It's Sir Graham. Oh. Hello, Sir Graham. Hello, Temple. You got my message all right, then? Yes. Hello, Steve. I got my car on the corner, Temple. I think I should come over there, if I were you. We can see the main entrance to the hotel. Yes, all right. Where's Bradley? Bradley is over on the other side, watching the side entrance. He's with the Flying Squad people. Good. We're leaving nothing to chance this time, Temple. Come along, Steve. Jump in the back, Steve. Thank you. The Kelvin hunch turned up trumps all right, then. Looks like it. Bradley was on his tail from the moment he left us. Incidentally, it looks as if some of the drugs were parked in the left luggage office at Waterloo. Kelvin picked up a case there about 20 minutes ago. Then Kelvin, Charles Kelvin is Valentine. Oh, what's that? Who's that leaving the hotel? It's all right, it's not Kelvin. But Sir Graham, if you know that Charles Kelvin is Valentine, and you know that he's in that hotel, then call Calling car Earth, KB789, don't... calling car KB789. Just a minute, Steve. Calling car KB789. Hello, Bradley. Hello, contact. Sir Graham, there's a car just pulled up to the side entrance. I think this is it. Yes? Yes, it's Kelvin. He's getting into the car. Who's driving, Bradley? I can't see, sir, although it looks to me like... They're moving. They're coming round the block, sir. OK. Warn the squad people, Bradley. This is it, Temple. Have they got to pass here? Yes, yes, they can't help it. Get down, Steve. Get down in the bottom of the car. But, Paul... You must tell you, you, darling. Have you got a revolver, Sir Graham? Yes, yes, here we are. What are you going for, the back tyre? Yes, unless we have a chance to... Here's the car! Here's the car, Temple! They've spotted us. Get down, Steve. Oh. 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 Darling, are you all right? Yes. Now for it. You've hit it! You've hit the tyre! You... My God, the, the car's turning over! It's turning over! What a terrible accident. What a terrible accident. We've got Kelvin, sir. Good. Is he badly hurt? He's in a pretty bad way, Mr. Temple. And Valentine? Dead, sir. Valentine? But but I thought Charles Kelvin was Valentine. No, darling. But, but Paul. Paul, then who is Valentine? Come and see for yourself, Mrs. Temple. Come along, darling. Excuse me, sir, you can't... Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Temple. There we are, Steve. Why? Why, it's... Sheila Baxter. Yes, darling, Sheila Baxter. Alias... Valentine. Another cup of tea, darling, please. Sir Graham? Not for me, thank you, Steve. Have another scone. Paul, don't eat with your mouth full. <laughs> what do you mean? Is don't you talk. You know perfectly well what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sir Graham, I think in many ways this Valentine affair has been probably the most interesting case I've worked on. You see, from my point of view, it was interesting because quite early on, I discovered that one had to examine this case without prejudice and with rather... Rather, rather an unconventional outlook? Exactly. Mm. And what do you mean, darling? Well, I think I'm correct in saying that when Scotland Yard first heard about Valentine, they laboured under the impression that the organisation was a comparatively new one and that, like the Rex, Lorraine and Marquis organisations, it was controlled utterly and completely by one person, namely Valentine. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, of course, this wasn't the case. The organisation had been in existence for some considerable time and, when I was first introduced to the case, was actually undergoing certain rather, um, how can one put it, rather revolutionary changes. In short, Sir Gilbert Dryden was endeavouring to force Sheila Baxter, or Valentine if you like, 
out of the picture... And gain and... control of the organisation himself. Mm, exactly, Steve. Oh. You see, coupled with the fact that Sheila Baxter, Sir Gilbert Dryden and Charles Kelvin were working together, so far as the general activities of the organisation were concerned, we had to contend with the fact that privately, Sir Gilbert was intent upon double-crossing Sheila, and Sheila was intent upon double-crossing Sir Gilbert. Now, let me give you a perfect example of this. Dryden, Sheila Baxter and Charles Kelvin discovered that I had visited Snooker Riley. They also discovered that Snooker and O'Hara, who incidentally were part of the organisation, were accordingly suspected of double-crossing them and were taken care of. Sir Gilbert, Sheila and Kelvin all agreed that Kelvin should contact a certain Mr Leyland and pay him to impersonate Captain O'Hara. This Captain O'Hara, in other words Leyland, would send Steve and myself to Estonia Avenue. On arriving at Estonia Avenue, we would find the dead body of the real O'Hara. In other words, a nice friendly warning telling you to keep your nose out of their business. Precisely. But Charles Kelvin, at Sheila Baxter's suggestion, brought Sir Gilbert Dryden's name into the story, the story that Leyland was paid to tell us during his O'Hara impersonation. And Sheila Baxter strengthened the story by placing the note addressed to Sir Gilbert on the mat at Estonia Avenue. Sir Gilbert, of course, knew nothing about this. He simply thought that Leyland had dished out the original story. But, darling, that night, the night Sheila Baxter was attacked downstairs near the lift, was that... It was Dryden. He had discovered by then that Sheila Baxter had taken a knife bearing his fingerprints and planted it by the dead body of Snooker Riley. In other words, oh. he now knew that she was playing precisely the same double-crossing game as himself. But I don't quite see how Charles Kelvin fits into the picture. Don't you, Steve? Isn't it rather obvious? Kelvin and Sheila Baxter? Kelvin's wife may have been a drug addict, but I bet you a fiver that's not why she committed suicide. Incidentally, you remember that night, the night the revolver was placed in our bedroom? Yes. Sheila Baxter told us that she'd overheard Snooker Riley make arrangements with Sir Gilbert about the revolver. Well? <laughs> Snooker Riley never fixed that contraption up, not in a thousand years. He couldn't even open a tin of sardines without splitting the tin from end to end. <laughs> <laughs> the revolver was planted at Sheila Baxter's instructions by a man called Stoner. Lefty Stoner. Suddenly, in order to get herself into our confidence and to throw even further suspicion onto Sir Gilbert, Sheila changed her mind and, well, you remember that telephone call, the very first one we received. Yes. Now... To get back to Charles Kelvin... Oh, I meant to tell you, Temple, whether we discovered why Kelvin murdered Charlie King. Apparently, Charlie King had decided to take sides in the issue and was violently pro-Dryden. Yes, I guessed that when I realised that Dryden was a fairly frequent visitor to the San Chow. Incidentally, Sir Gilbert discovered that Kelvin was playing in with Sheila. That's why he sent him down to the house at Brasham. He knew, after I picked Leyland up at the San Chow, that there was a pretty good chance of something going wrong. Quite obviously, the whole business was coming to a head. But tell me, Temple, did Jules Conte, the Frenchman, did he telephone Sir Gilbert and make arrangements Of course for... he didn't telephone Sir Gilbert. When Conway realised that his friend O'Hara, the real O'Hara, had been done away with, he contacted the one person that, so far as he was concerned, really mattered, Valentine. Sheila made all the arrangements for Sir Gilbert and Conway to meet and then double-cross the pair of them. Well, I can understand you suspecting Sheila, darling, but I still don't quite see how she gave herself away. Don't you? <laughs> no. No, I don't. And don't look so pleased with yourselves either, the pair of you. Well, you see, Steve, last night Sir Gilbert didn't actually escape. What? Oh, he got away from Piccadilly, all right. But uh, Temple and I picked him up about a quarter of an hour later in Leicester Square. <laughs> but what about that radio announcement? Ah, uh, yes, the um, radio announcement. I got into pretty hot water over that temple. I'm afraid I persuaded Sir Graham to send the radio announcement out, just as I persuaded him to release Charles Kelvin. And you see what happened, Steve? Sheila Baxter was under the impression that Dryden had escaped and but was... But he must have escaped. He telephoned her. Oh, no, he didn't. It was Kelvin that telephoned Sheila Baxter, darling. He telephoned her and told her to meet him at the Esplanade Hotel. As a cover-up, she pretended it was Dryden. But I knew it wasn't. I knew it couldn't possibly have been Dryden. You know Weatherby suspected Sheila Baxter? Yes, I know he did. He was searching her flat when we got there. 
But what about Hodson, the sergeant? The man Superintendent Weatherby left behind on the landing? No, he had to be got rid of, so far as Sheila Baxter was concerned. She didn't want him to tailor to the Esplanade, so... But you don't understand, darling. Hodson heard Dryden. He heard the two of them struggling in the flat. He heard... He heard Sheila Baxter screaming her head off against a gramophone record. Hodson broke the door down, dashed into the flat, and as soon as his back was turned, she... She let him have it. Oh, how horrible. Yes, but it's all over. Yes. Yes. But, Paul... Paul, it isn't all over. What do you mean? That girl. That girl. Who was that girl? The girl that... Oh, the... Uh, the girl that completely disappeared. Yes. Do you remember what happened that night, darling? Well, of course I remember. Weatherby walked to the end of the mews, and when he came back, he said... He said, well, there's no one there, Mr. Temple. Yes. <laughs> yes, but I'm afraid she was there, Steve. She was there all the time, and Weatherby... But if she was there, Weatherby must have seen her. Oh, of course he saw her. As a matter of fact... As a matter of fact, it was his daughter, Steve. He planted her in the car and then walked round to the hotel in order to... Planted her in the car? <laughs> yes. And by Timothy, she put up a pretty good show. Well, we were determined to arouse your curiosity and interest you in the case, Temple. After all, you seemed particularly indifferent about the whole business when Peter's well. knife... <laughs> <laughs> well, never mind, darling. From now on, no more mysteries, no more murders. Just a nice, quiet holiday. Are you going away? Mm. Yes. We're going down to Bramley Lodge first thing tomorrow morning. <laughs> And I'm going to sit back with my feet on the mantelpiece and, as Sam Dodsworth would say, think of nothing more important than the temperature of the beer. <laughs> if there is anything more important, Sir Graham. <laughs> you lucky people. Oh, well. I must be off. I'm supposed to be catching the 6.15 to Denford. Well, goodbye, Sir Graham. It's been grand seeing you again, and I sincerely hope that the next time... Did you say Denford? Yes, Why? Well, it's only two miles from Bramley. Is it? I didn't know that. What are you going down to Denford for? You mean to say you haven't seen the papers? What do you mean? Well, it's a most extraordinary business, Temple. The local people are completely out of their depth. About a fortnight ago, they pulled a man out of the river. His name was Shearer, Carl Shearer. Go on. Well, uh, apparently this man Shearer had a peculiar mark on his right arm. The sergeant, a man called Brigson, was the first to notice it. The mark apparently was just below the elbow temple. Yes, and, yes, and, and, and by a remarkable coincidence, it resembled in outline... Oh. The... By Timothy...